the podcast for the inquisitive diver. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Scuba Goat podcast, where we explore the fascinating world of scuba diving and ocean exploration. This week, we are talking photography and rebreathers with multi-award winning photographer Nicholas Remy. With a passion for the ocean and its inhabitants, Nicholas captures the beauty of the underwater world through his lens and is eager to share his art with fellow enthusiasts. However, Nicholas is not just a photographer, but a bit of a super geek. He analyzes situations, technical products, heck, anything that needs analyzing gets analyzed. He also loves to help aspiring photographers capture that perfect underwater image. And so, with his expertise in underwater photography, love for the ocean, and abilities to formulate plans and procedures, he has created the Underwater Club. Now, the Underwater Club is an online community that anyone can subscribe to, regardless of your level of experience. Over the last couple of years, he has tirelessly devoted himself to producing detailed, bite-sized videos and a multitude of classes to share his expertise with all club members. Welcome to the show, buddy. Thank you, Matt. Nice to meet you too in person. Yeah, it's it's been a while. I think I've been um, I've been watching what you and and Lena have been doing since I got to Sydney, which is what, almost five years now. I think. Yeah, right. I yeah. think we've been. I think we got to Sydney sort of at the same time then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Five years ago, some something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I only came for a visit initially, and then uh, hey, presto, here we are. Yeah, right. <laughs> Um, why don't you start off the show? Let's have a little bit about you. Um, why are we sat here and, and going to talk about stuff? Okay. Um, well, my name is Nicolas Remy. Uh, I'm a French-born uh, guy. I'm 39 years old now. Um, what can I say? I've got a lovely two cheeky monkeys at home keeping me busy and entertained. <laughs> Um, By cheeky monkeys, you mean kids, right? Not monkeys. Yes, yes, no. (laughs) (laughs) In case that wasn't clear. Um, And I've got a wife as well who happens to be a diver, underwater photographer, and uh, and a river diver as well. Yeah. So I have lots of things in common. And, uh, yeah, the main reason I came at the same time as you to Sydney was essentially my passion for diving. Mm. And, um, yeah, look, I'm... uh, uh, a few years later, uh, I decided to make underwater photography a full-time thing for myself. Mm-hmm. And I guess that has to do with the fact, the fact that we're talking now. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, happy days. Yeah, yeah. And the, th- the thing that caught my attention when you were doing all the socials, because obviously when you get bored in an evening, we all do it. We just scroll through socials. Uh, your photos pop up and, um, you know, you, you delve a little bit deeper. And the first thing I remember seeing of you guys, and I, I mean yourself and Lena, was going diving, getting these amazing, amazing shots, but you were doing it on rebreathers. Mm-hmm. So that was the the different thing that caught my attention. Right. Initially, it wasn't the shots initially. Yeah. It was the fact you were doing it on rebreathers because obviously I've been told by many people if you're on a rebreather, there's no bubbles, you get closer to the critters, blah, 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 blah. That's exactly what you've been doing, right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, rebreathers are, are really, they're, they're the photographer's best friends as long as I guess you can. Uh, you know, sort of keep your attention, giving them a little bit of attention that they need to sort of keep diving safe. Yeah. They're, they're just fantastic for, for, for underwater photography. Yeah. I mean, you get closer to wildlife, you spend much more time in the water, you don't have to worry too much about, uh, you know, you don't have to worry so much about things like currents. Mm. Um, the opportunities are very different, and that's, uh, yeah, that's why we both, uh, we both uh, rebreathe on a regular basis. Yeah. I mean, every, every time we dive, basically. Yeah, yeah. And you get a good couple of hours underwater as well, eh? Yeah, I mean, it's, it has to do a little bit with the cheeky monkeys I talked about at the, at the <laughs> beginning. Um, we, we've been together, Lena and I, much before we had you know, projects of starting a family. Mm. Diving has been our thing since nearly the beginning. And at some point, we're like, okay, we'd, yeah, we'd like to have kids together. And then, you know, we looked around what others were doing, and usually they were giving up on diving or the sort of, you know, uh, full-on passion, right? Mm. And then we thought, okay, th- there's lots of, I guess, life adjustments we're very much willing to do, but stopping diving is not an option yeah. at all. Yeah. So we're thinking, okay, and the thing is, I guess, if there's one person in the relationship diving, not the other, you can always, you know, uh, lock some time for you and have a bit of me time. But we wanted to keep diving together. Mm. And we thought, okay, what's our young parent life going to be like in terms of diving? And we thought we need to just lock a time for diving 
every weekend we were both working full time. So every weekend there would be a time for that where we won't be parents, we'd be divers. Yeah. And we said, well, let's say Saturday morning, we have to lock some time. Saturday morning, we'll find a babysitter and maybe we'll trust them with the kids for half day. Half yeah. day seemed like what we were comfortable to do. Not a, not a full day, but half day seemed reasonable. Mm. And then we said, okay, so if we leave the kids to the babysitter, we drive to wherever is the shortest dive site, we go in the water, we dive, well, one hour on a boat maybe, then we want to have another dive. With all the surface interval, we actually don't have time. Yeah. And we don't want our dive routine to be one hour per week. Yeah. So like, okay, what else could we do? Well, to save time, you save time by not exiting the water, not preparing your gear, not changing tanks and all that. Mm -hmm. And long story short, you know, time after time we said, okay, well, why don't we just spend a good three hours in the water? Mm. And this way we make 100% the most of the time that we're giving ourselves to keep on enjoying diving. And yeah, that's what took us there. Yeah. Happy days. Mm. So the bank balance is well in the negatives, having bought a couple of rebreathers. <laughs> mm. Yeah, and, and that's that's probably a thing about uh, about us as, as divers. Um, when I chat with you know, other divers, very quickly you start talking about travel, where you've been and all that. Mm. And I think I've been diving now since 16 years, something like that. And I think people are always surprised to see how little I have traveled, you know, compared to how long I've been diving. Mm. And that's because, yeah, our life setup has been around how can we lock in as much diving hours as we can per week. And that may imply, you know, not being able to travel so easily outside. Yeah. And that's why Sydney is so, so good. That's also why we came to Sydney, because we realized that, well, if we only are going to dive three hours per week in one shot, mm. and we have to be in a city that's big enough for both of us to find a job, yeah. where in the world could that be? And Sydney ticks the box really well for all those things. Nice one. Nice one. What is it, what is it Lena does then? What's the, what's the job that she's doing? Uh, she's, she's working in IT. She's doing project management. Nice. Mm. Okay. So does she get to choose like uh, project lengths and then just have a little bit of time off and crack on with a load more diving and then pick up the next job? Uh, for now, I think that would be a good thing for her. That would be a great setup for her. But for now, what she's doing is uh, she's a full-time employee. Okay. So it's more uh, it's more a weekend thing for her plus the odd trip every year or something like that. Yeah, yeah. And what were you doing before you went full-time on what we're going to talk about? Um, yeah, I was doing IT, same as Lena. Actually, okay. we, we started working in the same company mm -hmm. and we've been doing IT together, sort of together for a few years mm. until I finally chose to... Switch path. Yeah. <laughs> Run away. <laughs> <laughs> Good on you. So um, where did it all start then? Because you, you mentioned you've been driving for, what, 16 years? Yep. Where did you learn? Um, so funny enough, not too far from here. Okay. Um, so long time ago, we started dating. Back in the day, we were, um, we were studying in the same engineering school back in France. Mm -hmm. And the school had an exchange program with a few universities. And one of them was Wollongong University. Oh, right. And we thought, wow, Australia. Hey, that sounds, you know, um, I had a family history of, you know, uh, being an expat living abroad. And after a few years in France, being a student, doing those things, I was like, yeah, it tickles me. I want to go travel again. Hmm. And, I, and, and some guy from the same engineering school came back from Wollongong and he said, wow, guys, you, have, you can't believe <laughs> the lifestyle there. It's, it's amazing and all that. And I spoke with him and I was like, man, I have to go. That, that sounds fantastic. Yeah. And lucky for me, Lena was, didn't have much, exper much experience traveling at the time, mm. but she said, oh, you're going? Well, I'll go with you. Okay. Nice. You know, for, for, you know, we were just a young, young couple with uh, not so much history, but then she said, I'll go as well. All right. <laughs> and then <laughs> we, we jumped on a plane to, to Australia. And um, a bit before we did that, actually, she told me, hey, did you ever try scuba diving? And I'm like, no, but I've always meant to... At some point, you know, probably. And she said, you know what? Australia apparently is pretty good for that. Mm. Like, ah, okay. And uh, yeah, long story short, we ended up in Wollongong. And um, I mean, before that, we were traveling a little bit before settling down. Yeah. And uh, at some point on the trip, it was my birthday. And such a lovely girlfriend. She had planned a tri dive for me. Well, I didn't know. And then we were in Kangaroo Island, and she said, hey, you know what? Uh, tomorrow we're going to dive. We're going to meet this guy here. He's going to teach us, and we're going to dive. Brilliant. No, I was terrified. <laughs> I was like, gee. <laughs> oh. 
you know, I was like decompression sickness. How am I going to cope with the safety stops and all those things? I was yeah. very stressed, actually. <laughs> And then he, then he took us to a dazzling two meters depth, you know, and I uh, mm -hmm. managed to survive and, uh, and I loved it. Brilliant. Yeah. And never looked back. Never looked back. Yeah. I mean, then we went to, uh, to settle down in Wollongong. We learned diving in Bass Point, not too far from here. Yeah. Uh, loved it. Uh, lots of diving during a year. And then we went back to France because family reasons, essentially. Mm. And then we dove essentially in the Mediterranean Sea for about 10 years until we came back here. Oh, Okay. Okay. What do you see in the med? Yeah, not much. <laughs> <laughs> Plenty of wrecks? Uh, some wrecks, yeah, definitely good wrecks. Um, yeah, the thing is, I I'm sure the med has potential to be sensational, but it's a sea that has been surrounded by so many people for a long time over history. There's been lots of overfishing, mm. pollution at times where we didn't know better, we didn't know what we were doing. Yeah. Um, and you can see the results. So back in Wollongong, we were diving in Bass Point. You know, we jump in the gutter, one of the popular spots there. Mm -hmm. And often enough, you would see a sea dragon. You would see a big blue grouper coming right at your face, yeah. a big bull ray. At the time, Lena was very um, so short-sighted. Yeah. Yeah, short-sighted. But she didn't need a prescription mask because the things were so massive that she <laughs> would see anyways, right? Yeah. And then... We go to France, we land uh, next to Cannes, we find a dive shop, they take us diving. And for young divers, we are just open water certified. Mm. You know, we are not used to going deep and doing those things. The guy pulls us down from zero to 40 meters very fast. And we are like, you know, a bit stressed, but okay. Mm. And we're thinking, okay, we're going to 40 meters. We're going to have to tell that all to all our dive buddies. And I'm sure we're going to see some crazy things at 40 meters. Mm. Well, we saw one lobster mm -hmm. and maybe two sea brims, yeah. and that was it. Yeah. And they were like, oh, crap. And then we asked ourselves, do, are we actually going to keep diving or do we just keep on a regular basis? Or do we keep that for, you know, the odd trip to the Red Sea once a year and, uh, and that's it? Yeah. But eventually we, we, we decided we really liked being in the water and, uh, you know, uh, that's so we kept, we kept diving. But, but, but for sure, the... The, the, the Med has a, few, has a few things we really like, you know, big dramatic landscapes, mm. nice Gorgonians, but from a wildlife perspective, yeah, not, not comparable to the air. Pants, mm. Yeah. Well, what's your, um, what's your favorite so far? Wildlife. Like animal? Yeah. Oh. I think, um, well, there's a few, but I think I really like the, the, I was going to say weedy or leafy. Let's say the leafy sea dragon. Leafy sea dragon. Yeah, yeah, yeah they're so lovely. I've yet to tick those off. We were oh, going to go. We were going to go this year, but I've got Galapagos trip, so yeah, that's okay. we go next year. Yeah, it's it's yeah. not a, a not yeah, a bad plan hard, B. Right? It's not a bad excuse not to go to the South Australia. Right? Yeah, <laughs> and it's really easy to go. I mean, you um, as long as you know where to go, mm. we can talk about that. Uh, it's from the shore, shallow, easy, and, and the beautiful creatures to see. Yeah, yeah. I think that's the uh, the beauty here as well. Um, you've just mentioned depth, but um, a, a, along the coastlines here in Australia, you don't need a lot of depth to see such a vast array hmm. of critters and creatures. Yep. Biodiversity is insane, isn't it? We, we're really fortunate. Um, I've read somewhere that in Sydney Harbour, Sydney's natural harbour, there's more fish species than in the whole Mediterranean. That doesn't surprise me. Yeah, I mean, There are probably more that. fish in my bath that I don't own than what's in the Mediterranean. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, possibly. No, we, we're very gifted. Um, on the sh I have landed in Sydney, like I said, uh, more than five years ago, a bit more than five years ago now. Mm. And I thought, okay, there's like, what, 30 shore dive sites you know, that will certainly be a good, good basis to keep us entertained. And then a bunch of other boat dives. Mm. And I was thinking, okay, and there's some wreck dives as well. And in those five years, I think I've done one, maybe, maybe two boat dives, and that's it. Yeah. Not because they're not good, but because the shore diving is so good, so spectacular, that, mm. you know, for what I do, which is photography, um, I enjoy so much going there, spending three hours or even even more, and, uh, you know, having those amazing, amazing things to photograph. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm making the most of this week because my other half, Jazz, she's away in... New Zealand for the week with work. 
Right. So I'm going to go and hit Clifton Gardens a few times and just spend all the time in the world on my camera and macro because she's not a massive macro fan. So she gets bored if I'm taking because shots of the taking little Taking too stuff. much time, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, especially that time of the year, the water is very warm. Yeah. Oh, it's seven. Yeah. I was, well, I was speaking to Ken, Ken Tongpilar, uh, oh, this morning, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, they did a night dive on Saturday. It was like 20, 21 degrees. Yeah. Nice. I'm not even going to bother with a wetsuit. I'll just put the shark skin on. Yeah, that is. <laughs> but I've been there yesterday evening, actually. Oh, yeah? So, by the way, if, I, if, you, if I'm asking you to repeat something, I might still have water in between the ears, so don't, don't take offense with that. <laughs> That's all right. But, I just uh, blame mine on age. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, yeah, that was fantastic. A bit, uh, bit murky, but there's always so much to see. Yeah, yeah. Do you get all the usual critters? Yeah, uh, and that's a good time in the year for uh, anglerfish, frogfish, yeah. and um, that's a time where this, this you can see them mating or you know having a bit of an interesting behavior. Mm-hmm. And yesterday evening, Lena showed me one, uh, showed me two actually, just next to each other, and it was like, gee, that that might be the moment, that might yeah. be the time. A yellow one, uh, very lovely yellow with um, like stripes on its ends, uh-huh. and another one which was more pale pink with dark brown stripes okay. lovely next to each other so i started taking photos and waiting but nothing happened but yeah. what about with they then so if you go in the main um the main jetty the main jetty section where mm-hmm. most of the fishermen are uh if you look towards uh, the inside of the harbor they would be on the pillars on the right gotcha. if they don't move they would be there yeah yeah okay i'll have a look we went out there uh, last week and there was there was two side by side down towards the end of the jetty, a yellow one and a black one, much smaller black one. Yeah. Right. Um, if they weren't getting jiggy jiggy, you might have got eaten. Yeah. You know what frogfish are like, at least anything. But the thing is, yeah, that's it. When they finish, it's it's dinner time. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Ciao. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, okay. So the underwater club. Yes. What's this all about? So the underwater club is. Um, is is a big turn in uh, my relationship with diving and underwater photography. Mm-hmm. In many years, it's all been about just enjoying myself taking photos. And, you know, the best way I could spend my time was being in the water, taking photos. And the next best way was possibly being next to Lena while she was taking photos and perhaps I was looking for, uh, you know, stuff for her to photograph, watching over her, helping her with lighting, doing those things together. Yeah. But that was really, that was, that was really it. And then um, COVID came, and like everyone, I had a bit more, a bit less work actually. I had a bit of more free time on my uh, on my hands. Mm. A good time to a good time to to reflect. And I had, I guess, I had grown a little bit frustrated at myself on the way I had I was managing my time. So I came to Australia to enjoy diving. In Sydney, essentially, because I knew it was so good, plus the odd dive trip once a year, maybe. Yeah. And then I realized that, yeah, well, the diving is really so good, and we know about it because we experience it, and we have a lovely community of people with the visibility group in Facebook where you can exchange tips, share what you've seen in a dive, so you know what's happening there mm. in the community, in the dive sites. And because of the routines that we had managed to set up you know, around our kids, our dive was going to be the Saturday morning, and that's it. Yeah. So if for whatever reason Saturday was a crappy time to dive, you know, tide change, big rain, whatever the case might be, or big swell in the wrong direction, mm-hmm. that's where we were going to dive. If there was some crazy good conditions or some interesting wildlife spotted middle of the week or on Sunday evening, too bad, too sad, I couldn't yeah. go diving. Yeah. And I was working a lot. My corporate job was very, very demanding. I must say, I've very interesting at the same time, but busy days with customers during during the normal nine to fives yeah. and busy evenings because it's a, I used to work for a European company. So in the evenings, I was catching up with colleagues in Europe. Uh, so very, very packed lifestyle. And I realized at some point that, you know, in a regular week, there was very few time for me to say, hey, I really want to do what I want to do, which is more diving. And I was thinking, okay, I chose to become a father. I love my chicken monkeys, and I chose to have this IT job. Well, it's a great job, but I love my kids even more. So if there's one thing I'm going to change, it's the job. Yeah. And I thought, okay, how can I 
you know, uh, make a living around underwater photography. And nowadays, as you as you know, um, you can't you can't really pay all your bills by just selling photos. Mm. That is something that was possible maybe 20 years ago, but nowadays you have to do a few different things to, um, to, to, to make up your new lifestyle, basically. Yeah. So I started to think, what are some of the things that I'm good at and that I would enjoy doing for the time that I'm not taking photos in my new life? And it struck me that in all, all, the, all the jobs I've had during my corporate career, there was one thing in common, very, very different jobs, but one thing is common is that I was on a regular basis having to explain complex topics in a simple way because the person I was going to explain it to was less technical or less expert than me on the topic. Yeah. And, and I guess that was my talent. That was something I was good at doing. And I realized as well that was something I really liked doing. I really enjoyed that process to, you know, be with the person, hear their questions, put myself in their shoes and see, okay, how can I take that person with me to understanding this new thing that I need to understand? I really enjoy that process. Mm. So then I told myself, well, I'm going to teach underwater photography. That's, uh, that's something I would enjoy doing a lot. And then came the question, and this, took, this process took uh, quite a few months to, to get the final ID, but then came the, came the question of, how am I going to teach? So typical example, there, there's a few underwater photographers teaching this way. You organize a trip. You mm -hmm. take, per, you, take uh, you know, a number of students on a trip with you. When you're on a trip, you have workshops, you have classes, you show them techniques, and you explain a few things. Mm -hmm. And that is something I'm going to do on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, for example, in uh, next January, I'm going to do that with Lembe Resort uh, during 10 days. But that's going to be an ad hoc thing. Because I've realized that there's another way to learn underwater photography, which is essentially how I've learned, but upgraded in a way. So essentially, the, um, the observation I came to was that all the moments where I learned, I learned a lot with reading books. I'm a very analytical person, so I'm, I guess that that's how I'm comfortable learning. Yeah. And I realized that all the aha moments where I realized that uh, I've, imp I've improved, I've been able to master a new technique, to take better photos of this subject or those situations, the aha moment was not underwater. Yeah. The aha moment happened at home, talking with someone in a bar in between dives. Yeah. In the water was the time where I would test the idea that I had before. Hey, if I would put my strobe this way, I'm going to project the animal's shadows here. Mm. In doing that, I'm going to help the silhouette of the animal pop out from the background. It would be less distracting. So I had all these ideas in between dives, and then it would just be a case of practicing in the water to just test the ideas that test my understanding was okay. And then that's how I came down to the idea of founding, uh, creating the Underwater Club. So the Underwater Club is, in simple terms, it's an online underwater photography school mm -hmm. where I've created, I've put basically everything I know in terms of underwater photography in uh, the format of essentially video lessons. And, um, and it's about to, to go live in a few weeks' time now. Yeah. 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 Congratulations. A lot of hard work gone into it. Eh? Yeah. Um, when we started, um, I had to, you know, of course, I, I asked Lena's opinion a few times because... There would be a bit of time during which he would have, uh, you know, to cope with me not having an income and investing my time on something else. Yeah. But she really liked the idea. The only thing is at the beginning I told her, okay, I'm going to do a bit of concept and design on the website, you know, make sure I have the right components, I know how to build it. And then there will be a time where I'm going to put together these, uh, these online courses. I'm going to script them, I'm going to uh, film the videos, I'm going to edit them and all that. And then, you know, just package it on the website, launch, and, and that's it. The, the, the Underwater Club is live. Mm -hmm. And I told her, yeah, the course is production. Yeah, it's going to take about five to six weeks. She said, okay, yeah, that's fine. We can, we can deal with that. Okay. It took a year and a half. <laughs> <laughs> 
Hey, uh, she's not divorced yet, so you must be doing something right. It's something. I, th- I think. <laughs> yeah, I-, I was very nervous the time where uh, I-, I hadn't, let's say, I had registered the first, uh, recorded the first course, mm-hmm. and I realized that we need much more time to do the whole thing. I came to her. I said, "Look, uh, this is what I've been doing. This is the time." Uh, you know, I've, I've taken to record these first few lessons. For example, at the beginning, when we uh, when we drafted the, the the plan of the courses and the lessons, we would say, okay, there will be a lesson on, let's say, portrait photography. How do you turn, uh, you know, how do you move away from a, just an ID shot of a fish into a real portrait with character? Yeah. And I said, well, the video is probably going to be three minutes long. You know, I'll script it, I'll speak quickly, and three minutes, that, that's it. Mm. And then for three minutes of video, you need so much and so much time to film, but that's going to be quick enough. Yeah. The video is about 15 minutes mm-hmm. because there's actually so much to, to say on the topic, especially if you want the person listening to be able to, you know, not be lost in translation or not yeah. lose track of what being, is being said. So I, I, I asked her, I said, do you still want to move forward? Are you still happy for me to spend, well, much more time in building this? And she looked at all the plan I put together, and she said, well, with everything you scripted here, there's enough to fill two or maybe three underwater photography books. So you don't write two or three books in one month. It does take time. Mm. So, yeah, that, no, that makes sense. Keep going. Yeah. And, you know, thumbs up, then, uh, then I went. Yeah. As that saying goes, as a, as a, behind every good man, there's a, an even better woman. And... Um, I'm just sitting here listening to you talk through this and I have exactly the same at home with reconstructing my travel company and yep. and jazz just, yeah, keep going, keep going, keep going. And those fuck it moments where you've had a shit day and just walk away from the computer, There's always, she's always there to say, it's all right, have a beer, come back to it tomorrow, mm. keep going. We're lucky, aren't we? Yeah, very, mm. very lucky. Yeah. It's, it's, that, it's that emotional support. I mean, it's also that, that sounding board you have as well, not mm-hmm. being just with yourself testing the IDs. Yeah. And um, I mean, I also have tested quite a few IDs with, uh, with friends. But the thing is, with friends, people sometimes are just polite. Yes. So, you, you know, you don't know ex- you don't, you're not always sure that exactly how they, how they feel. Although I did ask for, uh, you know, brutally honest feedback, and, uh, and I've got some of it. Uh, I have tested the ideas and the format, interviewing a few people, quite a few people actually a while ago, including yourself. Yeah, yeah, I remember it. <laughs> um, yeah, but, but definitely having uh, Linda's support for, for a number of, uh, a number of many ways actually has been fantastic. Yeah, yeah. nice one. Mm. Cheers to that. Yep, 100%. Mm. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So with, with regards to the dive-in and the photography, did the photography start on land before, or did the dive-in introduce you to photography? Um, the photography started just essentially before, but just, just a little bit before. Mm. I came very late to photography. Mm. So, um, Me too. I, are you too? Yeah. Yeah, yeah right. Mm. But um, I, I want to hear how you started as well. Uh, but um, I guess for me... I used to play around with my mom's camera when I was a kid, you know, old film camera, mm. and I enjoyed it. But I also remember from, uh, from that time that the camera was only capable of taking okay shots during the day. Yeah. If it was, you know, dinner time, it was a bit dark in the place, unless you had the flash going on, mm. everything didn't look good, basically. And if you had the flash going on, people had a funny face. It just didn't... I felt, well, I, I don't really like the sort of... I don't really like the sort of uh, results that the camera can take in many situations. So I went a bit away from underwater, from, uh, from photography at the time. Yeah. And then, I guess one year before we moved to Australia, as the first time as students, I stumbled upon a, um, uh, a photography magazine in a, you know, in a, in, in a, in a station. I bought it out of curiosity because I was going to take the train with Lena at the time and uh, you know, we didn't have smartphones, iPhones, so I was going to get bored without a magazine to read. Yeah, yeah. yeah you know that time, right? <laughs> Something to read, yeah. Ah, so different. <laughs> it's good to get bored sometimes. It is. It's fantastic. Mm. Yeah. But uh, anyway, so I, I, I pulled this magazine. I can't remember why, but it was in France, it was the, the biggest photography magazine, so mm. the most popular one. So the name, the name meant something for me. And then I read this article, and it was about some guy at the time, the, the, um, this, it was, what, 2006? 
So it was, you know, digital SLRs were starting to become more popular and more affordable for people. And someone was doing something really interesting. He had, devi- he had designed a, um, a device where he could, uh, what was it? He was going to pop a champagne bottle mm. and there was a device going to capture the sound of the popping mm-hmm. and trigger a very, very fast flash that was going to freeze the motion of that, uh, that champagne uh, or the cork. Or the cork, yeah. yeah. The cork in translation. And, and you would be able to photograph it. And I saw this crazy photo where you have the cork frozen with the champagne coming. Mm. And the guy did something else. He did like, um, uh, he used um, uh, like, a, like a gun, not, not the gun with big uh, bullets, the small one, you know what I mean? Oh, like a little pellet. Yeah, pellet, uh, pellet gun to shoot on uh, uh, dices, on a few objects. And he would capture crazy motion where the pellet starts to crush on the dice. Ah, okay. So not so artistic, but very interesting technically. Mm. And I was like, gee, cameras have come a long way. That's really cool. And it was more my, I guess, my technical mindset that was interested in the, in the science and in all that. So I was like, okay, that's really cool. You can really have fun with those things. Mm. Oh. And then I started reading more magazines. And I got into just the technicalities at the beginning. I was like, okay. And then I started reading the... Um, um, uh, readers uh, courier section of the magazine where people would send photos and uh, uh, and the journalist would critique the photos. I was like, okay, that's interesting. Oh, composition, all that. I started to get into it. Mm. And but at the time it was just um, it was just land photography. But I was really getting hooked. And um, and then Lena told me this this time when we were booking our tickets to Australia. She said, hey, did you know that Australia was really good for diving? And I was like, okay. I've always been fascinated by the water. Yeah. I've always, I, I grew up in Africa mm-hmm. in, um, in a place where I was not far from the sea, but we only had big rolling waves. Yeah. So there was never a place where the water was clear for me to go snorkeling. So I've always meant all my childhood to go and see what was there. Yeah. But there was no clear water for me to go. Where so, in, in Africa was that? Uh, Cameroon. Oh, really? Mm. That's a random one. How did you end up there? Uh, my, my parents were working there. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, childhood in Cameroon. There was a river by the place. We um, in my early years we were living uh, in in the in the bush in the jungle. Mm. There was a nice river with nice fish going there. Sometimes a snake, sometimes um, you know, a few other animals. But again, the river was murky yeah. and not very safe to swim into for other reasons as well. <laughs> so crocodiles and stuff like yeah. that, right? <laughs> So, so I've had all this childhood where I wanted to get in the water, but I couldn't. Yeah. So the only thing I could do is just, you know, walk on the rocks, look in the puddles, be like, oh, there's a fish, there's a crab, and be excited about that. Yeah. So when she said diving, I was like, yeah, that sounds really scary, but at some point I do want to do something like that. Yeah. I do. Yeah. And I was getting hooked with land photography. And before we could go to Australia, I had an internship for six months working in, uh, in an IT company as well in Paris back in the days. Mm. And so I was having, sp- I was going to spend six months every day, one hour commute in the in the metro train, and I thought, okay, I've learned a fair bit about photography with magazines and all that. If I'm going to go diving, I might as well learn underwater photography. And then I picked the first book, a book with 150 pages of underwater photography, yeah. and I read it in the in the daily commute. <laughs> and I was like, that's fantastic. <clears throat> that's I was really getting hooked. And I finished the first book, which was like the beginner level book. Then I bought the advanced book yeah. and I read it as well. Yeah. And I was like, wow, split shots, macro shots. And this is before getting in the water. Before getting certified, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I was, I was getting hooked in a very twisted way. Yeah. But uh, yeah, by the time I, I got certified, I knew how to use an underwater camera. I just didn't have one. Yeah, that's, mm. that's the problem. Mm. What was the first one you got? Uh, it was a good one, though. It was... Um, the Nikon D three hundred. Uh, I was I was so so hooked. So I we had a little compact T camera, Lena and I, for for our, most of our time in Australia. But then I, I had a side job, uh, you know, after the university, so I could save a bit of money. And I was clear that I wanted a proper DSLR, so I saved all that money. And then when I could finally afford it, bang, D three hundred and like five lenses. Yeah. And I was so crazy excited about, you know, all the photography time that whenever I would go somewhere, I had a bag full of all the lenses, yeah. which is totally nonsense because there's no place where you're going to use 
a macro lens, a short macro lens, a long macro lens, a wide angle lens, a fisheye lens, and a portrait lens, yeah. and a telephoto lens, right? But I was carrying the whole thing. Yeah. Sometimes I was like, gee, it's really heavy. <laughs> <laughs> One time we were stopping in, uh, on the way back to France with uh, Lena in Hong Kong for a few days. We, we, we had a, a bit of vacation in Hong Kong. And I love the town. Yeah. We had a fantastic time there. But then I realized that it was really hot and I was carrying, what, 10 kilograms of photography gear on my backpack. Yeah. And there was not a fly. You know, Hong Kong is very concrete, right? Yeah. There's no birds. There's no, I couldn't see much flies in the city. And then I realized, man, maybe I don't need that macro lens. Those two macro lenses in my bag, after all. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've done the same. I've, I've traveled with all the lenses, and you spend two or three weeks away and come back and realize you've only used one lens in the entire time that you've been away. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a steep learning curve, mm. but we get there. It's, I guess it's at the beginning when you, um, when you, get, when you get the hook, right? Mm. You see all those nice photos, uh, you know, sky photography, Animals, portraits, black and white, weddings, wildlife. You, you see all those things and why not do everything? Mm. But then you realize that you could have specialized somehow to get really good at something. Yeah. I, I've learned very quickly to think about what I'm going out to do. Mm. And there's always going to be something that you want to photograph that you've not got the right lens for, but mm. it's better than carrying that 10 kilos. Yeah. <laughs> so how did you get into photography yourself? Um... Very similar to you, to be honest. Yeah? Yeah. I didn't go balls out and spend thousands on a Nikon straight away, though. I've got a GoPro. Um, but as a kid, I did exactly the same. My dad, he played around with photography and, and enjoyed it, and he had a an old DSLR. And I used to play around with it a little bit. Never understood it. Um, but every Christmas, we'd get, like, a disposable Polaroid or something like that in the Christmas stocking. Or one of those... I don't know. How, how old are you, Nicholas? Uh 39. Okay. Do you remember the old disposable cameras that you could mount like six bulb flashes on the top and when they got used, they were gone? Oh, no, see, I didn't I, have the bulbs. See, yeah, um, I, I lived in Cameroon. I now. got 10 years, old, uh, 10 years on you. Yeah, Cameroon. Yeah, you're not going to get them. But yeah, I used to get those as well and um, we'd have the disappointment of taking the, the old reels or the old uh, mm. uh, rolls of, of, of camera to... Uh, or film, sorry, to uh, the local pharmacy and wait a week to see what you've got. Yeah. You know, and out of 36, you'd get two two photos that are okay. That's about it. Yeah. Um, so it never really grabbed me in a great way until I started going underwater. Hmm. Um, and like I say, I got, a, I got a GoPro. In fact, it was um, the year I left the military and um, went on a six-month diving holiday on my own just headed for thailand right and i took a gopro with me it was the first gopro that i'd bought oh uh, that's when you went you became dive master and you started teaching right um yeah just yeah i was on holiday and then just randomly got asked if i'd like to take over a dive master position eventually and instead of going back to the uk after six months holiday i thought yeah fuck it i'm gonna stay here there's beers beaches women in bikinis mm. living the dream pate pad thai yum <laughs> yep. um, but yeah so I started with the GoPro and then it was um, or it might have been 2015 2016 something like that I picked up a, a, a Canon G7X Mark II right. and um, that's when I started to kind of focus on what I was trying to do with it mm -hmm. and um, eventually ended up with a couple of strobes which completely threw me off for mm -hmm. the first god knows how long yeah right yeah and then about a year, 18 months, no, 18 months ago now, I mm -hmm. got the Canon M6 Mark II. Mm -hmm. And um, that just threw me straight back into learning how to use a camera again because you're going from a compact to a, you know, a mirrorless and everything changes. Yep. Um, so. It's the next level of complexity, right? It is, yeah. And you, you kind of get up to the, I got up to the maximum that I could do with the compact mm -hmm. and then thought, right, I've got to take the leap. I'm going to get a mirrorless because it's it's lighter and smaller, easier to carry on overseas trips, all that kind of stuff, blah, blah, blah. And um, stumped for that one. It's a good camera, hmm. but it put me right back into the novice group again. Yeah. You know? it's. I remember when um, when I finally got my D300, my first DSLR, the mm -hmm. thing we had before was like, back at the time, it was popular type of camera. It was called a bridge camera. 
So it's like a compact with a, with a very big zoom lens, basically. Okay. And it was very easy to use. Uh, you know, you, you would see what you're shooting, basically, like, like, on, like on a compact camera. Like on a compact camera. And the day I started using the DSLR, I was like, gee, yeah, there's a steep learning curve. But same thing with your mirrorless cameras. Those things have so many options. You can do everything manually. Yeah. But until you figure out those options and they, they become like second nature that you're familiar with them, mm. well, you're going to miss shots. You're going to be having to practice a lot before you get the full potential, basically. Yeah, yeah. I've kind of, um, I've got the, I think I'm about 70% of the way with a wide angle. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm still way below 50% of the way with a macro. Yeah, right. So, um, yeah, that's why I'm going to go and do a couple of dives this week and just focus on the macro and, and play around with the stroke positionings and the camera settings and all that kind of stuff. Hmm. You know? Um, yeah, Clifton Gardens would be a good place for uh, for practicing those skills because uh, if you, yeah, you'll have to put position the strobes in a way that you get your subject, not too much of the water around it to yeah. get clear photos and all that. So it's a good... When, when you, I guess when you dive in a, in a lovely tropical place, you go to Bali, for example, you don't have to position your strobe so perfectly. As long as you get some light on the subject, you're, you're good to go, basically. Yeah. You go to Clifton Gardens, well, getting the light isn't just one thing. Then you want to minimize how much back scatter you've got, and, uh, and that definitely is a good way to sharpen your skills. Uh, definitely. Yeah. But then doing that in Clifton Gardens, next time you go to Bali or God knows where, tropical Galapagos and places like that, you're going to take fantastic shots. Yes. Hopefully. Mm. Otherwise, it's a very expensive wasted trip. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you want to double up on, uh, you know, on, uh, on the learnings, the, the Underwater Club is coming in soon. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm always up for learning. I think um, even if you're a master of something, you, there's always something else you can learn. There, there is. And, um, and there's two things um, I've noticed, not only with my way of learning, but with chatting with friends that have uh, diverse photographers as well, is when you don't practice some skills for a while, it just, you know, it just, uh, it just goes away. I mean, it doesn't go really away, but it um, wears out a little bit. It does. And uh, I find myself, even when I was learning everything by books, if, let's say, I was doing macro for a long time at home because there was only macro to shoot, mm. and then I was going on a trip where I might see manta rays or big wreck, big wide angle, I would go back to my book and I would relearn basically or refresh whatever I um, I learned by I knew before basically mm. from the last trip. Yeah, and uh, and that's one of the things I like with um, with the Underwater Club is that I think lots of people are doing um, you know uh, infrequent diving mm -hmm. or the infrequent in the sense that they will go in a tropical destination once in a year, twice in a year maybe, and I think having the option you know to go back to your courses, go back to your learning when you need it, I mm -hmm. think it's going to be pretty pretty handy in those cases. So how have you, um, how have you structured the uh, delivery? Um, how many videos are there? How many different levels? What kind of people is it targeting? Mm. Um, I've got, in total, about 40 uh, lessons. 40? Yes. Fucking hell, you have been busy, haven't you? I've been busy. <laughs> <laughs> and the 40, each of the lesson is split into smaller videos as well. Okay. So how many, I think, more than 100 in total, probably. Okay. But the reason for that is, well, first of all, underwater photography is complex and on wide topic, as you know. Mm. And the other thing is I wanted to make sure that the, you know, the videos would be, the knowledge would be able, you would be able to consume it in a bite-sized format. Mm. So if you're at home, you know, after days of work, you're in your couch, you have time, you want to spend one hour learning underwater photography, pop your TV open, open the underwater club on your phone, air play, and you're watching on a big screen, you're relaxing. Yeah. But if you're on the daily commute and you just have 10 minutes of your time, then most of the time the subsections of a lesson are less than 10 minutes long. Yeah. So there's always a time where you can spend a few minutes. If you have a few minutes to spare, that's time you can spend learning or practicing underwater photography. Mm. Um, so that, that that's about... You know the the volume of the content and the I guess the, the way I've structured it, the way I've the way I've diced it in, in pieces. Mm. In terms of structure, I ask myself a lot of questions about what's the right way to present underwater photography, and I think I think that there is not one way. I think we all there's ma there's various ways you can learn. Mm. Some people will start with macro. Some people will go wide angle. Some people will not use a strobe or a video light at all for years because mm. maybe they shoot very close to the surface. Um, some people, well, th th there's various learning paths. And 
the way I've presented it then is to say there's a map. The lessons are presented as a map. So you're looking, it's a mind map, basically, okay. where you can see themes. So a theme might be wide angle. A theme might be lighting as a skill, underwater lighting. Another one might be the equipment, the photography equipment. And within those themes, you can see with the lessons positions on the map how they relate to each other. So, for example, before you start uh, learning about how to turn a fish ID shot into an actual portrait with character, hmm. you might want to learn how to position your strobes. And you might ask yourself, hey, do I want to use one strobe or two strobes? So the lessons are arranged on the mind map in a way that tells you that you probably want to have those skills before, but you don't have to because perhaps you know some of those things or you just want straight to understand what are the artistic considerations in making a portrait mm. as opposed to the technicalities of, hey, one strobe, two strobes, how to position the strobes. So I really wanted to organize it in a way that no one feels they have to go in a special order, yeah. but they see the map. The map is clickable, so you can click and have a pop-up telling you, hey, this is what it is about. And then if you click, you have more details about the content. You know exactly what you're going to learn. You have guidance on whether you should know this piece of information before taking this lesson to make the most of it or not. Mm. And, um, and uh, yeah, this is a freely, uh, I would say, well, eligible. Yeah. Free-flowing. It's free-flowing, yeah. yeah. It sounds fantastic. Mm, thank you. Quite frankly. I've not seen it yet, but it sounds fantastic. Um, I'm a very um, visual learner. Yeah. And um, that, that kind of mapping, I would say, excites me over the idea of having chapter, sub-chapter. In the least. Watch this, watch this, watch this. 100%. Yeah. I think it... For, for learners like you, I'm the same. And I think most people benefit from having a visual layout of how the concepts connect to each other, the mind map mm. really, to say, okay. Because when you start, you're like, hey, I'm a diver, I want to, uh, I want to learn photography. You don't know what you don't know. Yeah. You know, how do you know that, how would you know that, um, you know, there are specific skill sets and techniques and uh, best practices in working with a model? Mm. You see beautiful photos of a wreck with a model looking positioned in the right place with their legs straight and all that. If you don't know any better, you're like, well, um, that person must have just been taking photos of a diver passing by. Absolutely not. All those good shots, they are all staged. Yeah. Most of them are staged. And you don't know those things if you're a beginner. But if you're starting off and you're like, okay, here is everything I can learn. Well, I'm keen for wide angle. Wide angle sounds good as a start. You go to wide angle, you're like, okay, Close focus wide angle, all right. Shallow water wide angle. You can see the themes that you could uh, get started. There was a lesson for camera settings for wide angle. If you just want a bit of technical guidance on the settings that would work well. Mm. And then you're like working with a model. Ah, there is such a thing. You have to work with the model. Interesting. What is it about? You go there and then you realize that there's hand signals. There is best practice in how the model position themselves, what they wear, where they look, and all those things. Yeah, yeah. How many hours do you think you've put into this? In a year and a half. Uh, the thing is, I don't think I know too much. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, I think I'm, I'm at 30 minutes of, uh, of work for one minute of video. And I've got 16 really? hours of video in total. Holy shit. Yeah. And that's just the beginning. Yeah, yeah. Because people joining the Underwater Club, as becoming members, mm. will also have access to monthly webinars where we get together, we talk about particular topic, we dive into some techniques, we exchange, we do things like that. Mm. So that there's going to be more, uh, more, let's say, more video contents. Yeah. And I really want to make it something that lives. Um, for example, because there are, there are especially technical aspects, but not only, that are going to uh, become, uh, things are going to change. So for example, there is a course where it's all about photography equipment. So I cover basically every single bit of kit that you might find in an underwater photographer's bag. Mm -hmm. Because again, you don't know what you don't know. Why would someone need a focus light? Yeah. What would they have arms? What do they need floats for? And all those things. So I cover all those bits. In each and every lesson, I explain what are the specs that you find in one of those things, uh, like a strobe, for example. What are the important ones? So that, you know, as a, as a consumer, as a photographer, you're equipped to decide what's important when you're going to buy your straw. And um, what, was it, what I was saying again, um, talking about equipment. Yeah, um, 
we were talking about the uh, the add-ons. So you're going to have the monthly yes. webinars and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, correct. And in one of those lessons, I'm talking about cameras. Mm. So I'm going through the various types of cameras that you might use for underwater photography, your GoPro, your compact, your DSLR, your mirrorless. And I'm comparing them side by side for the various, you know, uh, let's say, criteria, autofocus, image quality, things like that. Mm. And I'm saying, for example, as of today, for underwater photography, DSLRs have an advantage over me or less for such and such things. But I know very well that next year I might record the video again to say something different because the technology is catching up. Yeah. So this is a big body of knowledge, but I'm going to make it to evolve it as well over time. Yeah. I mean, people have got to, they've got to give allowance for the advance of technology because no one can keep up with it. Mm. It's so fucking fast. Yeah. You know? Um, interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. So um, you, you mentioned that the Underwater Club is going to be uh, a membership. So is it subscription-based? Yes, it's going to be a subscription-based um, because I, I thought about different models, different ways of, of doing it. But I really think that as you want the knowledge to stick as the sort of photos that you are going to take over time um, are going to change when you travel, you need to be able to go back to the knowledge and the learnings and so that's the so that's the way it's, uh, people be, basically get access to the content. They mm -hmm. become members. This gives gives them access to the courses, and this they become part of a community as well. Yeah. So they get access to the monthly webinar, and there is also something very close to my heart as part of the Underwater Club that that will be for members. There is a dedicated members forum where we exchange about photography, but. I want to do it in a very specific way. I want this to be a place where we're going to give each other constructive mm. feedback on our photography. Mm. Because I think that is a massive, massive, massive way to progress. Yes. And um, so that, that would be something very, very important. At the beginning, I would probably myself be doing most of the feedbacks. So, cause, so today I do it in a one-to-one <clears throat> -one basis. Someone can hire me for a one hour, two hour coaching session where we talk about underwater photography. Yeah. But I think there's a lot of learning that can be had from reading a constructive critique of someone else's photos by first person. Mm. So there will be that component. But I also want over time to take on board other members of the club with me to become criti to, to, to formulate critique themselves. Yeah. Because I think even if you're, you know, very beginner in underwater photography, of course, the critique, if it's given from a place of care with respect, it's perfect, it's very useful. Mm. But if you're a very experienced photographer yourself, spending the time to formulate a constructive critique onto someone else's photos is also a great way to keep on learning. Yes. And I think that's, that's going to be a, a very beneficial, like a virtuous circle that would be taking place between members. Yeah, I think that benefit is, is circular as well because a lot of people are too overcritical of their own shots. Yes. So being able to critique other people's work and then hear honest and open opinions of their work rather than, yeah, that's good, Matt. Yes. You know, and and just make you rethink and, 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 and reevaluate actually I'm a little bit better than what I thought I was. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's too it's too easy when you when you get hang on to the technicalities mm. to see the defects. To say, oh yeah, the composition is not right. Yeah. You're not exactly on the third. Or it's a little bit overexposed there. Or here there's a fish, the tail is cut. But look at competition winning shots. In many competitions, among the top winners, you see defects on the photos. Yeah. So and that's that's the that's the artistic sensitivity that we all have mm. that we can exchange when we critique each other. But when you're on your own watching your photos, you, you don't get those things. So you're trying to tell me that uh, those awards that you've won, you've got defects on your photos. I do sometimes. Do you? I do sometimes. I can't fucking see them, mate. <laughs> um, I, I, I do sometimes. Um, but I, I'm, I'm a bit like you. I'm overcritical of myself. Yeah. And there are photos where, where you know, I'm like, no, no. You know, miss, there's a fish, a shark tail. I've got a photo, for example, that did very well in a few contests. Mm. It's like a big school of grayness sharks in Southwest Rocks. Mm. The lighting is great. The look of the shark, 
you know, the layout, all, everything is good, but there is one shark in the corner who has a tail cut. Mm. But there's 20 sharks in the photos. Yeah. For that reason, when I took that photo, I was like, meh, you know, it's not making the final cut. Fortunately, yeah. I didn't delete it. And then, as I was building the Underwater Club, and I spent nearly two years going back into my photos because I needed to find materials to illustrate what I was teaching, basically. Mm. And I went back to other photos, and I was like, hey, wait a minute, it still looks quite okay, this photo, actually. Mm. And I asked some friends, I'm like, okay, actually, these 10 photos of sharks from Southwest Rocks, yeah, they look good, actually. Maybe not competition material, but they look really good. So I asked a few friends in a WhatsApp group, hey, what do you think if there was one photo that stands out? What do you think this is? A few people pointed this one. And then a few others pointed other photos. Yeah. And the last one I was like, yeah, well, I'll try the other ones in, in competitions this year. And next year, I'll try this one that I'm still not convinced about. Yeah. The shark with a, a cat tail, right? Tail, yeah. Well, I entered it in Ocean Photographer of the Year. Yeah. And I won first place in their Conservation Hope category. And I think that contest is, I think it's the biggest contest in terms of ocean imagery in the world. I think so. And I was like, man, okay. I, I can still see the defect on the photo myself. Yeah. But having listened to other people telling me, no, it's really good. Mm. The emotion, the emotion is, excuses the defect, basically. Yeah. And th well, that just, that just bolsters what I just said about people being overcritical of their own work. Well done, by the way. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> but there's two sides to... Um, I think there's two sides to this story about the emotion you put to your work, right? Mm. Being overcritical, definitely looking at the defects because you want, ideally, a shot with no defects to go to a competition and being fixated on that, you forget the positive vibe or the emotion that you have in a shot. But then the other way around is sometimes you get too emotionally attached to a shot because you struggled so hard to create that shot. Mm. And you're like, that's the shot. That is the best. That's the one I'm going to enter in competitions. That's the one I'm going to pitch to magazines. That's, that's the shot. And sometimes you also need that critical eye from someone else to say, yeah, it's sharp, it's colorful, it's a great animal, but yeah, it's, it's like a good ID shot. Really, that it doesn't yeah. stand out. Yeah. Ah, okay. It's not got the wow factor. Yeah. yeah. There, there is a photo, for example, we, uh, which, and I can, I can, honestly tell all my love and my admiration for that photo because it's not mine. It's a photo by Lena. Okay. Um, we were having a fantastic dive for once in the Mediterranean Sea in a place where the local fishermen, the local professional fishermen decided within each other, you know what, let's make it a, a marine park. Let's stop fishing in that place for 10 years and see what happens. And long story short, it was fantastic and they decided to do it again for 10 years. Yeah. So we went to that dive site and in the med, you can see sometimes the Mediterranean grouper. It's called the brown grouper, dusky grouper. Very iconic fish from the med. Mm -hmm. Iconic because it's been overfished. It's like a puppy coming to sea in the water. So at the time when people didn't know better, they were just pair fishing it yeah, to like extinction. Yeah. So now you see more of them because they, they've been protected for a few years. But long story short, if I can make long story short, I'm not sure about that. That's all right. We've got all the time in the world. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, we go to, the, to this dive site, and at some point, oh man, that was memorable. At some point, we see two Mediterranean groupers, two big ones. They were males, because they, they become males at the end of their, 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 their life as they grow. Mm -hmm. And they were doing something I never saw. Usually when, because there must st still be a fair bit of um, poaching happening, even though they're protected, they tend to stay a bit away from you. Okay. Uh, with rebreathers, not so much, but with regular divers, they do take their distances. In that place, though, they couldn't care less about the divers. They were hammering each other. Mm. So basically, the, the, the two groupers, they were fighting. From a distance, when you look at the photo, you, you could think that they are kissing, but they're certainly not. They're fighting head on head. And you could hear the noise in the water, bang, bang. And you could see, you could see the fish scales really? pop. Crazy action. And Lena was holding the camera that day. She was taking photos. I was just, you know, either enjoying myself pointing critters or being a model. Yeah. And when I saw the action... You never know how long it's going to, to, to last for, so you have, to, you have to get the shot. And I saw the action, I saw where I was. I'm like, there is no way I'm going to be able to swim out before she takes the shot. Yeah. She will have half of my body in the shot. So I said, okay, well, what's the other option is that I go in there and I position myself perfectly. I make sure I look in the right place. I do all these things right. And that's what I did. So you've got a sh photo where the two groupers, they are head on head, symmetrical, center of the frame. And I'm coming... Um, in the middle, 
slightly sideways and I look right in the middle of the fight. Yeah. Perfect position, all that. It's a perfect shot in my view. I'm very attached to it. Lena, Lena likes it a lot as well, mm -hmm. but it never wins in competition. It never, it never succeeds, success, success, successes. And, uh, and I'm not sure why. Some people tell me, oh, it's a great natural history moment mm -hmm. that she's photographed, but there's you, a diver here, you're spoiling the thing. And I'm like, well, there's lots of photos where with animals and a diver, but I don't know, something there doesn't work. Yeah. But we have so much emotional attachment and every now and then we still enter it in a competition to see it, uh, you know, not win, but uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, emotional attachment really. You could hang it on the wall. Yes, that we can certainly do, yeah. yeah. Now, in fact, that's one thing I need to do. And I've never done it. Of all no the photos I've got, I've never actually... In fact, it, it was one of my friends here in Sydney who... He was the first dude to get one printed up. Yeah, right. One of the walls. Shots. Yeah. yeah. In his apartment. It's the first time I'd seen one of my photos in real life instead of digital. How did you feel when you saw it? Oh, brilliant. It's great, huh? Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. So I, th I think we need to do it at home. Yeah. I think it's, it, it's, it's a thing you know you have to do, but, but do it because you, re you will feel great. And I, and I think there's lots of, um, there's lots of photos that look... Um, even better in print than they, even better in print than they look in in real life. Yeah. Um, I have two screens at home, and I re, um, when I'm pixel peeping a photo, there is one screen when a photo might start to look a little bit I don't know noisy, doesn't look very good in terms of details. Mm. On the other screen, it looks better. Yeah. Different resolution, but then most of the time, if I print, there would be some small defects, some small noise that are just smoothened away by the printing process. Yeah. And, and when you you print, you've made a good print, a big print, you're not going to, to stare at the photo from five centimeters, right? You'll be you're standing back. You stand back and look at it. Yeah. 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 And, and, then, and then you're going to enjoy what you see. Yeah, yeah. Gee, I'm the worst interviewee. I don't bring any beer. I don't bring any photo. Shame. Yeah, yeah. You shit. I know. Oh. <laughs> but I can take you up for a beer afterwards if you have time. Yeah, yeah, mm. that's good. Um, in the meantime, I'll just drink the one beer that's left. Do. Please uh, do. Lovely stuff. Mm. You've got all the thinking to do. I'm just chatting and rappering and all that. Oh, don't worry about that. I can. It's that's the beauty of of doing a um, not not doing it live. We can just cut shit out. So when people get nervous and there's pregnant pauses or they do this and they move away from the microphone, we can just redo. It's mm. all easy. It's lovely. Stuff. But how do you know if uh, like there's a sound issue? Would he is, is he is he telling us uh, rubber? Just editing afterwards. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, uh, what the routine that we do is, I mean, I'm obviously we've got the headphones on here, yeah. so I'm listening to what's going on with your microphone yeah. and background noises like this little fan and all that kind of stuff, and um, I just make a, a mental note, and then um, once we've finished today, mm. Rod uh, will send me the raw um, tracks mm. tomorrow, and I'll listen through to them again while I'm working at home on the PC and um, pick up those little bits and pieces that I want removed. Right. So I just note the time and then send the data back to Rod. And oh. he, he takes out, he does all the editing. Right. And then balances all the noises and all, does all that magical stuff that he needs to do and sends me back, uh, adds on the intro and outro and, and sends me back the, the final edit. Good stuff. Yeah, it's, um, it's worked well. And like I, said, I, it's I been, wish I had someone helping me with the audio for all the, you know, for all the lessons I've recorded, <laughs> man. Sometimes... I can't, I can't remember how many times, you know. Um, so I'm doing that from uh, from a study in my in our house, yeah, uh, in the south of Sydney. And the number of odd noises that you've got at home that you don't pick unless you're doing your recording sound. Mm. I told Lena at some point, hey, "Did you hear the parrots?" <laughs> like, no. Did you hear the planes? The all the planes? No. Did you hear the people working there? No. Did you hear the neighbor? And you don't pay attention to those random noises unless you're like, I need silence. Yeah. Mm. How, have you have you created a box around your microphone so that you can kind of eliminate those? No, because I'm uh, you know I'm wearing the oh, Rodi. Oh, you're on the Rodi, aren't yeah. you? Yeah, yeah I, I need to change my setup because I, I did this way because there would be times where I'm filming myself holding a, a housing and moving some strobes and all that, and that mm. wouldn't be practical to have something in front of me. Yeah. But in reality, the housing thing is like one every ten lessons. Yeah. Most of the time, I'm talking. I'm displaying photos next to me. I'm displaying talking points. But, uh, but you, that you know what nice. you could do? Mm. Have, a, have a chat with Rod here. Because at the times when you need to do something that you want to record mm. you on, 
messing about with gear, you could come in here and use one of these microphones. Yeah, right. And there's plenty of space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, space, yeah, as yeah. we can see here. And just record it. And you've got no noise on the outside. Yeah. And yeah, because it, it's got yeah. all the soundproofing. Uh, yeah, that's it. Yeah, right. I like these, um, these boards that he's got up. You know, there's also the um, foam padded ones, that, like wavy foam. Mm. Um, when I do recordings at home, I tend to, I've got a, like a, almost like a milk crate, mm. which I've put the, the foam on the inside and that, that sits with the microphone coming through from the back. So the, the microphone itself is completely unhoused by foam around ah. it other than this section where I'm talking. Right, 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 right. Yeah. So even with the window next to me, if someone's outside and they're walking past or a dog yapping, yeah. the microphone doesn't pick it up. Great. Mm. Okay. All little, all little tricks. All little tricks, yeah. Mm. You know, I've learned, uh, I've learned filming myself. I've learned a few things. I've learned Elementor and all those things. I might as well learn uh, how to do proper sound recording. Yeah, yeah, Gee, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm scratching my ass with the Elementor at the moment. It should be more intuitive, right? Yeah. Some, sometimes you're like, list of bullet points, and the bullets doesn't align with the points. And you're like, that's what you do for a living, man. Yeah. Why can't you do it wrong? Yeah. Well, I'm faffing about with the uh, flex boxes and um, loop carousels. They're a great oh. idea. Yep. And so are templates. But, you know, if you make a template, it's a template. It's never going to change. Hmm. You know, you can't, you can't use the same template on a different page and edit it because it's going to edit the other page as well. Hmm. So I, I find it a bit frustrating and a bit limited, but hmm. it's certainly better than what it used to be. And uh, yeah, I mean, generally you do, you can, you can build beautiful pages uh, mm. this way. And I'm, again, I'm lucky about uh, with Lena because she's a bit nerdy herself. Mm. And uh, there's a few situations where I'm like, it doesn't look good at all. Yeah. She's like, let me, let me look at it. Yeah. And since a kid, she's been, you know, doing projects like, a, like an ad, like a display, like stuff like that. So she's very visual in that sense. Yeah. Very artistic. And also she's a bit nerdy. So sometimes she does custom CSS for me. Or oh, HTML. get out of it. Yeah. The, the giveaway thingy, there's a carousel which shows the prizes. Yeah. There's like a good strobe, some fins, some masks, stuff like that. Mm. And the, 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 the carousel is a, um, is a, is a WordPress uh, widget, right? It's a plugin. Yeah. And those guys, I don't know what they're thinking, but they serve the carousel and the images are shrink. So basically, you can't see the prizes. And I'm yeah. like, how do you think that's okay? They're like, oh, yeah, we're going to upgrade our software. Yeah, yeah, you should, but I'm, I'm stuck. Yeah. And then, then I looked at it and she said, okay, I might be able to do some CSS and help you out. And she did. She pushed the whole thing and it, it looks okay. Brilliant. Mm. Okay. So when I get stuck, I'm going to message you and ask for the boss lady. Yeah. <laughs> Lovely stuff. Mm. Um, hey. Um, what we got on? Oh, the um, the giveaways. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about the giveaways. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, like we said before. I'm super excited because the Underwater Club is about to go live in a few weeks' time. So by the end of March, people will be able to go on the underwaterclub.com and they will be able to see the courses, see what's offered there, and hopefully start their free trial to see what it's like and become a member. But Sorry, just jumping in there. Have you, start, have you selected a particular date that it's going to go live? Um, I think it's, it's going to be most likely the 31st of March. Okay. It's, yeah. Yeah, probably the 31st of March. Okay. Um, but if you go to the underwaterclub.com before, there's a little surprise there. I'm running a giveaway to celebrate the launch. Mm -hmm. And it's very simple to enter. It's a free giveaway. You don't have to purchase anything. The only thing is you have to enter your email address, join my mailing list, basically. Mm -hmm. And this way you will get notified when the Underwater Club goes live, when there's events around the Underwater Club and things like that. Yeah. And, and there's quite a few nice prices for underwater photographers, at least underwater, uh, these are things that uh, would appeal to underwater photographers. Are we, are we allowed to say what the prizes are? 100%, yeah. Go for it. Yeah. So the top price of the giveaway is a wonderful premium top range Retra Flash Pro X Strobe. So Retra is a uh, European-based company. Mm -hmm. They manufacture top quality underwater strobes, so underwater flashes. Mm -hmm. And I myself have been using almost exclusively a pair of their flashes, two Retra Flash Pro, for the last two years. Okay. Most of the um, awards I'm winning with underwater photos have been used. Have been using these two strobes basically. Mm. And I'm 
nearly jealous of whoever is going to win the prize <laughs> because the strobe that Retro is sponsoring for this giveaway is actually even better. Yeah. It's the X version. So it's basically the strobe I use myself, but with an upgrade in terms of, I think it recycles 20% quicker. There's a few nice things like that. Okay. But the quality of light is fantastic. It's powerful. There's a range of accessories you can fit onto the strobe when you want to go in Clifton Gardens, do a bit of snooting. Mm -hmm. You can focus the light. You can do lots of things around the, around the light. So it's, it's a fantastic strobe. What do they retail at? Uh, the, I think it's like uh, nearly two grand, nearly $2,000, one strobe. Holy shit. Yeah. So that's this a, is a giveaway? It's a giveaway. Sure. It's for free. Sign it's me up. Pretty big price. So can I put in my 15 email addresses? <laughs> yeah, you're supposed to put one. But what you can do, though, what you can do is you put your email, and that gives you a uh, one entry, mm -hmm. one free entry to the giveaway. Uh, I'm asking a little questions to whomever wants to answer about what sort of camera they're using for underwater photography. Yep. If you answer that question, you get a second entry. And then if you share the giveaway by email or by Facebook, you'll have your own private link with friends, and you get some friends to sign up through your link. Yep. For each friend you recruit, you get an extra entry. That's awesome. So if you share a few people, then you know if you're a bit active with that, you increase mm -hmm. your chances dramatically. I need the link then, because I've got quite a few people. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. So theunderwaterclub.com. Yeah. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Okay. So that's the first price. But then the second price is... So basically with the prices, what I did is I went to potential sponsors mm -hmm. and I decided to approach sponsors that manufacture the gear that I use myself because I wanted people to win things that I'm items that I'm sure are excellent for an underwater photographer. Yeah. So the second prize is a pair of fins. So these are the Mares 70 Quattro Plus fins. Oh, yes. You know them, right? Yeah, that's my second set. Yeah. yeah. I think someone told me that these fins, they are like probably the most popular fins I don't know if it's on the planet. I don't want to make big statements like that. But basically, yeah. if you go to a popular dive destination, you see dive masters diving a lot, doing 500 dives a year. Mm. That's the sort of things they're using because they're so durable, right? Yeah. I love them personally because as a photographer, I need to do flutter kicks sometimes if I really want to dash through a current. Mm. But if I go diving in Clifton Gardens or in very mucky places like that, I do frog kick yeah. so that I glide over the water and I don't stir up all the bottom and, you know, waste the visibility and all that. Yeah. And those things are excellent for both, those, uh, for both that sort of thing. So, so I think they're really good. So that's the second prize. Then we've got a 200 euros voucher to use on a retro um, online shop. So if you don't get the strobe, but you still want to buy one or you want some accessories for your strobe, you can use that as well. And then we've got a mask, a Mares mask, the Ultra Liquid Skin Vision Mask. Oh, that's super comfortable, isn't it? Oh, that, that's the one I use now. Really? And that's the first mask I can use without any leak, yeah. even if I forget to shave. My, yeah. my previous mask, if it wasn't perfectly shaved, it was a mess. And as I'm doing very, very long dives, like three hours, four hours, I can't have a leaking mask. That's so uncomfortable. And this one doesn't leak, and it's very wide vision as well, so good for, you know, seeing your finding your subject, finding your whatever accessories you've clipped on your BCD and stuff like that. Yeah. And the last prize is a beautiful The Underwater Club t-shirt, the, the same I'm wearing today. Yes. Very good, sir. Very good. Um, yeah, so everyone who's listening in, theunderwaterclub.com. All right, we'll repeat that. We'll put it in the show notes as well. Right, thanks. And, uh, yeah, smash that out of the park. 31st of March. So you're hopefully going to be very busy from April onwards. Yes, yes, I think so. Mm. Um, um, I'll be actually traveling at the same time because, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's going to be a, it's going to be a, a busy a busy month for me. At the end of the month, I'm going to ADEX in Singapore. Yeah, which is the time that we're launching the Underwater Club as well. Okay. So, but fortunately, as you know, uh, there's 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 not only me working on this. So Lena is going to is going to help me with. Uh, administrating the site if uh, if I'm busy doing something at ADEX and uh, yeah then the month of April will be will be very interesting I can't I can't wait to have people you know go there experience it uh, there, there's a trial that mm -hmm. you can uh, enter for free you can start for free when the club is live so you can access everything for seven days without having to pay yeah. and this way you can test mm -hmm. that my style of teaching the formats of the video, the pace, everything feels right, you know. Yeah. And then if you're comfortable, then you stay and then you become a member. Mm. So I was excited enough and, you know, very keen to see people, 
you know, going through the giveaway, starting to enter, put their email, ask me questions sometimes, watch the little videos that I've put there to present the prices. Um, I can't wait to see people, you know, taking the courses, interacting with them, telling me what they think. Yeah. So I'm also asking at the end of every lesson for feedback. So I want to keep this improving over time. So if someone, you know, sees that maybe I could have delved into more details in one topic, I'm quite a detailed person, but if that's the case, that can always be the case. I would mm. love to get those feedbacks. If they weren't fully sure about something, an explanation I gave, maybe it wasn't so clear. Again, give me feedback. I want to improve it. And anyways, people can interact with me as well through the Underwater Club. I'll be there to help. Yeah, that's awesome. And are you are you having a stand at uh, ADEX? Are, huh? are, you, are you having a booth? No, I will be just there. Uh, I will be reporting for Dive Photo Guide. Oh, really? Hmm. So you're going to be doing a bit of microphone in a bit or just... Uh... Um, I think I'm going to uh, to visit a few stands related to underwater photography yeah. and uh, check what are the news there and I will write an article on the way back. Okay. Yeah, okay. and yeah. P- perhaps a few other things, but uh, that's still being uh, considered. Yeah. I did get asked if I was going this year and I just can't warrant the price. I've got too much to do. Hmm. Uh, but it would have, been, would have been great to get in there and just have a wander around like I did at uh, Oztech. Hmm. Um, yeah. It's great to be in a dive show, right? Yeah, and Singapore has got to be one of the best ones as well. I think so. Yeah. I think so. That would be my first time going. But anyways, you go in those places, you you meet passionate people, you uh, you you network a little bit, you find out about the the, the latest tech, uh, the latest. Yeah, uh, I'm going to love it. I'm sure. Yeah. Have you got any? Did you, did you put any photos into a competition for ADEX? I haven't yet, but uh, I mean to do it. Yeah. Mm. I think so. They'll have a good display wall. Yeah, I think so. And they've got, and they've got some good prices as well. So, yeah. yeah, I definitely want to try my luck. Yeah, yeah. Well, you don't have to enter, like, the local competitions like Viz or anything like that anymore. You, uh, can, you can leave that bro- to us normal people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, are the rebreather that you're using, which one is it? <coughs> I used two. Okay. Um, so for many years, I've been diving exclusively with the uh, Revo rebreather. Mm-hmm. So Revo is a fully technical rebreather. That's the sort of thing you can, if you put some trimix in there, you can go to 200 meters with it. Oh, that's not my thing. I'm not a very deep diver. Yeah. I, I really use them for photography and long dives. But for many years, I've been diving exclusively the, the Revo. And then in 2016, Revo has been acquired by Mares. Okay. And... I, being very passionate, Reed River is something probably just after photography is the next thing I'm passionate about. And I was thinking, hey, what's going to happen with Revo, which was a kind of small company at the time? You know, it was uh, like a side project by a Belgian entrepreneur. Okay. This guy was getting a bit older, wanting to retire. What was going to happen to Revo divers? And then fantastic news in the industry, Mares acquires Revo. Mares acquired Revo because they wanted to create a more recreational river, but they needed to sort of get the expertise to do that. Yeah. And as a result, they came up with the Horizon, which is a more recreational, semi-closed river. But the thing I love about it is that there's lots of the design, uh, the, the good I- design ideas from Revo that have been incorporated into the Horizon. And now I dive the Horizon as well. Okay. And the, so the Horizon is a, a semi-closed rebreather, did you say? Yep. Okay. Do you want to explain that to folks that probably don't know too much about CCRs? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, so there's two types of rebreather, essentially. Um, fully closed rebreather, like the Revo, like the Inspiration, like the Kiss and those guys. Uh, fully closed rebreathers, what they do is, it, it's, it's all, it all comes from the fact that when you breathe, you inhale, let's say, air, and in air you will have 21% oxygen, and the oxygen is what your body needs. That's what it metabolizes. Mm-hmm. Um, when you exhale, there's still lots of oxygen left in the gas that you're going to blow in the bubbles. Let's say if you had 21%, there would be maybe 17, 16% left. Yeah. And the concept behind the rebreather is to say, hey, let's not waste to 16%. We can probably find a way to reuse them. So a closed circuit rebreather, like the fully technical ones, what they do is they take back the gas that you've exhaled instead of leaving the bottle go in the water. They find that, hey, you've used some of the oxygen. 
But then you have a pure oxygen tank on your rebreather mm -hmm. that's going to replenish just what, you, what you've consumed a minute ago. Mm. At the same time, it's going to use some CO2 filters to remove the CO2, CO2, which is toxic, which is part of what you're exhaling. So in summary, it cleans up the gas, removes the toxic CO2, and it pumps up whatever missing, whatever oxygen that you have consumed and would be missing otherwise. Mm. So that's a closed circuit rebreather. The way it works means that there's no bubbles at all coming out of the rebreather. Yeah. And because your body really doesn't use much oxygen, much less than we probably think, that we general public probably think, you, can, you don't use much gas. So on my closed circuit rebreather, I've got two tanks on the unit. I've got a pure oxygen three liter tank and a regular air three liter tank. Mm. The air tank is essentially just for my, my wing, my BCD, my dry suit, and for adjustments of what I breathe as I change depth. That's it. The pure oxygen is what really I breathe for being able to survive in the water. And with a three liter tank, I'm able to spend six or seven hours in the water. Yeah. Uh, if I'm really relaxed, in one hour of diving, whatever the depth, I'm going to consume about 20 bars of oxygen on a three liter tank. Mm. So that's the best efficiency you can get of any sort of diving apparatus in the water. Yeah. Full stop. Yeah. Now, it's a bit technical to use uh, because you need to get the gas exchanges, the number, the number of oxygen molecules perfectly right. Mm -hmm. As we know, if you've got too much oxygen and you run into other problems, too little, you get into hypoxia, other problems again. Mm -hmm. So it makes closed circuit rebreathers, the technical ones, a bit complicated to use. And some people consider them dangerous for that reason. Yeah. They, they do require more training and more vigilance. Now comes the semi-closed rebreathers. They work in a very, very different, well, in a sort of different uh, principle. You still use some CO2 cartridge filters to clean the CO2 out of your exhaled gas. You still need that. You don't want to start getting your headaches by breathing your CO2 again and again. Yeah. So that's the same. However, you don't have two tanks. You don't need pure oxygen tank. Those pure oxygen tanks, which are tricky to source depending on where you dive and all that, you just need a nitrox tank, one nitrox tank. You plump the nitrox tank onto your rebreather, and what the semi-closed rebreather does is it will always uh, flow some of that nitrox into your breathing loop, your breathing okay. bags. Yep. Okay? So let's say you have nitrox 32 in that tank. As you breathe, you're going to take it down to something else, like let's say nitrox 27. And if you keep breathing, you're going to take it down further, maybe nitrox 23, 21, and so on. So to compensate for that, your rebreather is going to keep injecting bubbles of the nitrox 32 from the tank. Mm -hmm. So in a way, with a semi-closed rebreather, your breathing keeps pulling down the percentage of oxygen, but your rebreather keeps on pushing nitrox from the tank to push it up. Push it back up. So they sort of compensate each other. Mm. But generally speaking, you've got, let's say, if your, if your tank is 32, nitrox 32%, you might be breathing only 27, 26, 28, something like that. Mm. As a result of this process where the semi-closed rebreather always pushes some gas, it pushes more than what you need. Yeah. So at some point, the rebreather is full of gas. It's actually always full of gas. So you've got a few bubbles coming up from the back of the rebreather. Mm -hmm. So that's a difference with a closed circuit rebreather. You do have some bubbles coming back. But there's very few, and in that sense, you still have the advantage of getting closer to wildlife. Yeah. And it's much safer because you don't, depending on the rebreather design, of course, you, the risk of going to hypoxia or hypercapnia or hyperoxia is non-existent. Yeah. And what's your bottom times like on the uh, semi-close then in comparison to the full CCR? So that depends, very, that depends more on depth yeah. and on... Um, and on the size of the tank. So um, my longest dive on the CCR was four hours, 30 minutes, mm -hmm. and I still have plenty of gas in my tanks. So it was more a case of I had, it was dinner time, I had to go, to go out. Yeah. <laughs> that was the reason. <laughs> lovely dive. And it was with um, the Sea Dragons in uh, Adelaide, by the way. Oh, nice. Oh, lovely place. Lovely dive. Yeah. Anyways, uh, with the semi-closed, with the, uh, the Horizon I'm diving now, um, it basically depends how much, how close you want the, 
the gas that you're breathing to be to what you have in the tank. So if you have a nitrox 32 in the tank and you say, hey, I really want to breathe at least 28, it's going to use lots of bubbles to keep you that up. Mm. If you say, that's fine, I'm going pretty shallow, I'm happy with nitrox 25, then there's going to be very few bubbles going there to give you that 25. Yeah. So long story short, if I'm shore diving in Sydney, which is between 5 to 20 meters depth most of the time, mm. Uh, out of a seven liter steel tank, I can do three hours and a half on nice. a semi-closed river. river. Yeah. Nice. It's pretty good. Yeah. And um, retail wise, mm. what's the difference in price between the two units? It's, roughly. Um, yeah, roughly, okay. Uh, so for the Maris units that I know best, mm. the Revo, I think brand new might cost you up to 15 grand now. If you take all the options, there are options there. But the one I dive would be new 15 grand. Yeah. The Horizon, I think this is seven to eight grand, something like that. Okay. So it's it's meant to be much more affordable. Yeah. yeah. An interesting thing as well is because Mares is really going full on with this rebreather, they're really this is something they believe in and they are they're making all efforts to to try and make it something white that you know spreads and, uh, and gets lots of support. There's quite a few dive shops now within Australia that have signed up for, for being part of the Horizon uh, dealership, basically. Mm-hmm. And as a result, if uh, I was flying to uh, Brisbane to go diving on Stradi, which is a fantastic place, by the way, for manta rays, mm-hmm. don't have to go to Maldives. They're, they are in, they're in Brisbane, basically. Yeah. There's a dive center there. They do re-rivers. They do Horizon. And I can rent a re-river from, the, from them. I can rent a Horizon. Don't have to travel with mine. Right. Perfect. Mm. Yeah. That makes sense. When's your next trip? When's your next dive trip away? Um, I haven't planned it, actually. I mean, okay. ADEX is just going to be the show and, and meeting people. Yeah. The thing is, I'm very, very fortunate to say that I'm going to become an Australian citizen soon. Hey, congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. No, I'm, I'm, I'm so happy. I'm so excited. And Lena and the kids as well. Yeah. But the thing is, we don't know yet when is going to be the ceremony, the yeah. citizenship, where you pledge your, allegiance, your loyalty to Australia and all that. Yeah, yeah. And I think once I have the ceremony, there will be a few weeks for me to wait to get a passport. Yeah. And until I have the passport, I cannot go out of Australia because otherwise I cannot come back. Really? Yeah. But are you on PR now, though? Are you on permanent residency now? I am. Yeah. But from the time I, I become a citizen, yeah. even if I don't have a passport yet, I cannot have a PR visa anymore because I'm a citizen. Yeah. So I cannot go back into the country. Oh, shit. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm a little way behind you. Mm-hmm. Um, we're just, uh, I'm on PR. Yep. But probably 18 months, maybe a bit more behind you. It's going to mm-hmm. be a couple of years before I get my citizenship and blue passport. Mm. But I didn't know that bit. Yeah, I yeah, think about it. There, there will be a, a few months where you, you, you can't really go out of the country. I mean, you, you would risk it. When I booked my trip to ADEX, I was, I was taking a risk because normally they give you an email one month before the actual ceremony. Mm. And I booked ADEX uh, five weeks before. Mm. So I was like, gee, if in the next seven days they tell me that's your ceremony, what do I do? Mm. But they haven't, so I should be fine. But yeah, long story short, I'm not going to uh, book any overseas trip in the next few weeks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that makes sense. Mm. Mm-hmm. Hey, let's get these questions out. Yay. Where's me? Uh... <coughs> I've got to put my glasses on. That's that's one of the big things. I mean, you mentioned it earlier on. You've got. Do you have like bifocal or bifocal lens in your mask? Uh, do, do you wear glasses? No, no, no. Lena used to need Lena. glasses, mm. but she and she and she had it at some point. Yeah. Did she get laser surgery and yes. shit like that? Yeah. See, I'm I'm I'm. I can't remember which way around it is. Long sighted, short sighted, whatever it is. I need reading glasses. Yeah. Like these things. Um, so I've been told by the optician that. It's not operable. Right. Um, so it's kind of tough shit, Matt. You've got to, you know, just grin and bear it. Mm. So I ended up getting, um, I got a, a prescription lens from uh, Osbob. Big shout out to him. Mm-hmm. He's just up in um, uh, Mona Vale. Right. Uh, op- optician there. I got the, the bifocal lenses in. And it's it's good, but your eyes continue to de- deteriorate for the, for the first time two to five years right so now it's uh, I've had the lenses for a year and I think I might have to get some more so it's another another sting in the pocket yep 
and it's torture as well because I, I used to be really good with the eyes. Yeah. So taking macro yep. was a piece of piss. Yeah. Now I've not only got to manhandle the camera, but kind of move the head to to get focus you on need the LCD. Those lenses only when you're watching something close, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's why wide angle. I'm taking more wide angle shots at the moment because they're easier to do for me. But you know what? What you what you might be able to do with your with your camera? What's your housing brand? Uh, Icolite. Yep. What you might be able to do is get from Icolite an angled viewfinder. Yeah. That has optical correction built in. Yeah. And if that's not the Icolite, I think Nauticam do one that you might be able to fit there. I Icolite do do it. They do. Yeah. But they're fucking expensive. That's an expensive piece of kit. Yeah. yeah. I but can't warrant it at the moment. Yeah, but if if you can when, when you can, it's not only good for your eyesight; it's also fantastic for framing. Yeah. You know, you'd be able to get closer to the ground and get a more more flattering perspective with the the critters because it looks better from yeah. from below. Yeah, at the moment I'm tilting the LCD screen on the back of my camera, yeah. so it's inside the housing, but it's on an angle, so I can do that and get it lower. Ah, right, okay. But I can certainly see the advantage of being able to get your your eyeball in there and, and get a proper visual mm. on what you're taking yeah because sometimes you take a shot looking at an lcd screen and you think oh that's going to be good mm. and you get it on the computer and it's it's decidedly average stroke mm. you know thrown in the bin straight away yep the other thing i'm thinking out loud but i haven't tried the uh, your, your specific camera but it might have focus picking you know whereby it gives yes, you like it a, does. yeah yeah so that might be a way because then it gives you a color indication that hey what you're seeing now is in focus yeah and you don't really have to see it for yourself you just trust that the color is uh, telling you hey that's in focus yeah, yeah it, it, it used to work well on the on the compact mm. on the g7x but i was limited with lenses on that so the only thing i could put on the front of that really was a cmc yeah. um but now with with this camera because i can put on 100 mil 60 mil yeah. 15 35 whatever um Sometimes it doesn't, it doesn't show up the uh, the peaking. Ah, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, pain in the ass. But there we go. Sometimes it works. Um, the frustrations of photography underwater, eh? I remember a photography book I've read, one of the first, where uh, the, the the writer was saying, the author was saying, sometimes underwater photography gets very frustrating. Mm. And the photo he had to illustrate the point was himself. He put his housing on the ground and he was holding a big rock and he was about to smash it in the housing. <laughs> <laughs> I love the shot because yeah, sometimes you get like, ah. Oh. Yeah, yeah. I, sometimes I wonder why. Even it was only last week. I think I was showing Jazz a couple of photos that had popped up, probably someone like Sil, uh, Salvo with his TG6. Mm. And she's like, that's amazing. Why can't your photos be like that? I said, well, they, they can, but, you know, they're not. They can. But, so how much is a TG6, I told her? How much is all the bits and pieces that he needs to do this? I told her. And how much is your kit? Not and I told her. <laughs> minus a few thousand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can see uh, I can see that sense. I had a friend like that, you know, the 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 the, the, the difference between what you what you do put into your kits and what you can really tell your spouse, no matter how lovely and uh, <laughs> you know, uh, understanding, right? <laughs> So I was catching up with that friend uh, from from France, a keen diver as well. We started diving together. He's also into photography, and it was you know the heart, the heart of COVID, where we were all doing zooms to catch up and you know remote drinks and all that. Yeah. And then <laughs> it was too funny. I I could see his face, and you know we were chatting, and he was like in the foreground, in the background. His daughters were doing their thing, yeah. and I didn't see, but his wife was walking in the background. And then I'm like, hey, so. What about this new ca this new housing that you that you bought and I've seen on Facebook? That, that sounds like some pretty good uh, pricey piece of piece of kit, you know. Yeah. And he didn't see any say anything, but the face he gave <laughs> me and the camera was like shh, shh, shh you know, big eyes <laughs> like that. I'm like, ah, all right. And then I started joking. So what do you do with the camera? Do you bury it in the garden? And she she doesn't know what's happening there. It was like shh, she doesn't know yet. Yeah. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> yeah, I know that feeling. Yeah. But um, it's all good. It's hmm. All part of the fun, isn't it? It is. All right. Let's have a crack at these 10 questions. So, uh, folks, if, you, if you're new to the show, um, this season, um, each guest is getting the same 10 questions, and uh, we'll see how they fare. You ready? Yeah. Okay. Number one. Um, how do you describe your pastime, now job, as a diver to people who are not familiar with the activity? I love that question because I tried to do it before. Yeah. Uh, recently, actually, I caught up with some friends, our ex-neighbors we haven't seen in a while, and it was my friend, and it was her 
a young daughter, 12 years, years old. And she's asking me, hey, Nico, so what, what, what do you do now for a living? You know, she's listening to the grown-ups talk, but then she's coming to the conversation. Like, what do you do? And I'm like, well, I'm an underwater photographer. A what? <laughs> well, I, I'm a professional photographer. I take photos under the water. And she looks at me, so you take photos of fish? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and then she goes, why? <laughs> you know, and I'm like, oh, okay. That's an interesting question. I started to think about the answer. Yeah. So, but yeah, I take photos underwater. Uh, I do that for my own pleasure, uh, magazines, clients, uh, to test equipment, and, um, and I teach as well. Yeah. Be nice. Hey, I didn't ask, what, what camera are you using? So nowadays I use uh, two. Um, one is a Nikon D500 mm -hmm. uh, DSLR, and the other one is a Nikon D810. Oh, you Nikon people. I'm, I'm clearly going down the wrong manufacturing route, aren't I? No. Nah. <laughs> Just you, you, you fall in love with a brand and it's hard to move away. It is. It, it is. Um, can you share a memorable diving experience that stands out to you as the best you've had? Hmm. I think, um, um, I think probably, I'm sure everyone you ask this question will tell you it's an art question to answer. Right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> But I think, um, yeah, I think I'll pick one. So Southwest Rocks. Mm -hmm. And for people who are not, may not be familiar with the place, it's five hours north of Sydney. It's a, there's a fantastic dive site right there called Fish Rock. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit offshore. Fish Rock is fantastic because it's, a, uh, it's an aggregation site for grainous sharks. So grainous sharks, they beautiful big sharks. They, they're called sand tiger sharks or ragged tooth sharks in other parts of the world. But in Australia, they aggregate in a few places on the east coast, east coast and Southwest Rocks Fish Rock is one of them. So when you dive there, the attraction most of the year is that as you wander in between the canyons, the cracks, and the remote reefs around the island, you will find here five grainous sharks, 10, 15 maybe, and over a dive, you might be able to see 20, 30 sharks. Mm. So that's the attraction, and I, I love that place. Now, the very special memory I have of the place is one day, We were spending a few days with Lena diving during, uh, during the summer. And um, summertime, lovely visibility, 25 meters Vs. And I reckon it was about 25 degrees in the water, which is like nearly wow. tropical, very comfortable. Mm -hmm. So happy days, you know. And then what happens is the, the winds have changed overnight. And that created a change in currents and a bit of an upwelling phenomenon whereby you've got cold water from the depth coming up to the surface. Mm -hmm. So we come back to the dive site, the same place day after, the water has dropped to 17 degrees Celsius, <laughs> so much colder, and uh, the visibility has dropped as well. It's not as blue, it's more green. Not too bad, it was like maybe 10, 15 meters, but very different conditions. Yeah. Now, there were a few good things about that change in condition. The swell was picking up as well, like we had two meters swell or something like that is that the other, we had less boats on site, less diving boats. There was only one, one boat, the boat where we are. Mm. And only five divers, Lena, myself, and a group of professional videographers. And we had the rock to ourselves. And we knew that in that sort of condition, something very special can happen. So what happens is the grainers, sharks, they, like, they don't like water to be too hot, but they certainly don't like it to be too cold. Yeah. So what they do then when it's so cold, all of a sudden, they cannot leave the rock so quickly They will go, they will gather tightly wherever they can get a bit of extra warmth. Yeah. And that meant in the shallows, like 10, 15 meters depth, at the entrance of the big cave that the ocean cave that Fish Rock is famous for. Mm -hmm. So the videographers were there to shoot some, uh, some commercials for a new camera. They needed to have some shots where there would be no other divers there. We wanted to have our own shots. We agreed that we would take turns being with the sharks. Yeah. And Lena and I, being on the rivers, when we go diving there, we don't come up in between the service interval. We just stay there for three hours. Mm -hmm. The dive shop, know, the dive operator knows us well, so they trust us to do that. Mm -hmm. And so we, told, uh, we agreed with the videographers, hey, first hour, you're out, you're doing something else, and then we will be on the boat, you come back, yeah, that's fine. So long story, long story short, I had that, that moment where I was in the, the entrance of the cave, I was surrounded by grainous sharks and I was just waiting for their movement to change and for the composition to fall nicely into shape. I knew where Lena was. Lena was not too far from me, like three meters, four meters 
behind me. Mm -hmm. She knew what I was doing. We know each other so well. She knew that she shouldn't ideally go into the shot. So she was watching over me, waiting, enjoying the show herself. And I had nearly an hour with the sharks just to myself taking photos there. Wow. And that, that was fantastic. I don't know exactly what you mean as well. It's beautiful when it goes off, eh? Mm. And, and when you think as well that <coughs> those sharks, they go there, it's natural gathering, right? There's no baiting involved. Yep. The, the, there are reasons to do shark feeding and all that, but here there's no need because they, they just gather to, to rest. They are half asleep, half awake during the day. They go there because they, can, they don't have too many currents. It's, it's a good place for them to be. And, you know, me being on a river, not moving by a single beat, just taking my photos, they were very comfortable, turning around, no disruption, and, uh, and I could take quite a, quite a few good shots that day. Beauty, mm. beauty. I've, I've not been to South West Rocks for ages. We should get back up there, because um, Fish Rock Dive Centre's closed for now, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, they are, they're transforming, as I understand. Um, they, are, they are going to change a bit the operation, but yeah, at the moment, they're not taking guests, so yeah. there's only one dive centre operating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, not to pay him a visit. Okay, number three. If someone wanted to pursue a career similar to yours in diving, what advice would you give them? Hmm. Um, I'll take that question as being becoming an underwater photographer as sure. a you know as a, as a, as a full time uh, um, activity, and I think w when people ask me what I do, people that are not the twelve years old kid that I told you about before that are, that is like huh well, why why do you do what you do? Yeah. Diverse at least when I tell them what I do. When I say I'm an underwater photographer, they're like, wow, oh, man, you're living the life. Oh, that's great. Oh, good on you. Well done. Because they think that I'm spending my weeks, my days taking photos. Sometimes I go back to the surface. I sell the photos to magazines, brands, dive centers. They pay me, you know, fortune and I'm keeping on enjoying the life. Mm. It, it doesn't really happen. Not exactly like that. Yeah. So as you, as you would know, so I think... For anyone wanting to make a living around underwater photography, not videography, we're going, I'll, I'll go to videography a bit later, but for stills photography, I think uh, the, people, the few people that are able to do it, they don't do just pure photography, they do other things. Mm. So I think that's my key, my, key, my key advice is to think about what are the other things you would have to do to sustain a living and be able to pay the bills and still dive and take as many photos as you can. Yeah. And some of the things people do today is, is typically organize trips, lead people, do photo workshops, uh, work in a dive center and being a dive guide as well. Mm -hmm. um, being a sci it's not something you start doing all of a sudden, but marine scientists can do photography as, uh, as part of their activity. And uh, that's, that's probably a good, uh, a good combination as well. Mm -hmm. But basically, think about the other things you will have to do to make a living mm. and then compare the living you have now, the lifestyle you have now, with whichever, whichever money you have, whichever free time you have that you can allocate to diving, and compare that with the to be picture. What would you have to do to spend time in the water the rest of the day? Mm. And I think ask yourself, read the question, hey, do I, do I really prefer this to be lifestyle compared to the lifestyle I have now? Yeah. Because it's, 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 it's a real question, it's a real reality check that, uh, that, I, recommend, uh, that I recommend doing. Yeah. Now, there is one way to still make, uh, make your living it's a bit easier around underwater imagery, which is videography. Brands, uh, you know, TV production ch channels, they still pay reasonable money for good video footage, good underwater video footage. So even if the thing that drives you is underwater photography, but if you see you can take pleasure in doing videography as well, that might be the way to, 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 to finance a living around making images on the water. Yeah, yeah. And I think it would be important as well. I mean, with all that going on, they've got to realize that you've got to make a brand for yourself as well. You can't just take a video, put it online, and expect someone to pay for it. Yeah. You know, it's got to have some reputation behind it. Yeah. So it takes time. The marketing side of things is, is really something that mm. you're an entrepreneur when you do that. Yeah. Even if you're just selling your own knowledge, you're an entrepreneur and you have to learn the online marketing. You have to be able to, to pitch your, uh, your skills, what you do. And, uh, mm. and uh, yeah, it's important to be conscious that that's part of the whole, the whole gig. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the most important things that you missed out on there as well is that, you know, anyone who's wanting to do this, they need to get on 
theunderwaterclub.com and uh, register and subscribe and learn how to do it. 100%. <laughs> It's one of the things I say uh, about the Underwater Club or my private coaching when someone hires me on a one-to-one on -one session is it took me, gee, it took me maybe seven years of practicing underwater photography mm. until I got to a level where I was seven or eight years. Oh, gosh. Anyways, long enough to practice doing underwater photography until I got to a level where I was being published on a regular basis. Mm. No, actually, not even published, but let's say I could see that my photos were at par with whatever was published in dive magazines. Yeah. And I was starting to win competitions. Yeah. It took me that long. But it doesn't have to be that long. Just because I learned the hard way, reading books, asking myself questions, challenging myself, lucky for me, uh, you know, exchanging with Lena and a few friends on what I could do differently, otherwise it would have taken me maybe 20 years. Yeah. So it took a fair bit of time for all those learnings, but I think with the Underwater Club, there's all this knowledge compact, organized around the mind map that we talked about, mm. and I, I think there's lots of people that will be able to learn underwater photography and become very good, faster than I did using this. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. And you've got to have some sort of structure to, to learn how to do this, otherwise... You end up going down so many blind rabbit holes, and it can be so frustrating. Yeah, yeah. And there, are, sometimes you don't even know that you're in a rabbit hole. There's mm. a, um, there's a, um, um, something I realized again. That I think that slowed me down for a good couple of years, if not, if not more, in my learning, which is that I started off um, with that nice shiny DSLR camera, mm. and I had two strobes at the beginning, right from the beginning. Yeah. And with my strobes, because I had read the books before, I knew that the strobes were there to bring back the colors mm. on my photos. So I was like, okay, two very powerful strobes. I was like, okay, I need these two, these two things to put colors on my subjects and remove the shadows. And if I can see on the LCD screen that they've done that, lighting is ticked. That's yeah, it. Yeah. Move on to the next thing. And so for many years, I had my two strobes turned on at whatever power, and I just blasting around. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, the colors are there, so okay, let's focus on the composition. But I was missing a point. I was missing a big point, which is that for a photo to stand out, you're not only drawing with colors, you're drawing with shadows as well. Yeah. And by just blasting away with two strobes, I was canceling out all the shadows. Yeah. And in doing that, my photo were, yeah, okay, but not great. Yeah. And someone had told me a few times, You should turn off one of the strobes and see how you go. Mm. You know, that, that's, that's an excellent advice. Turn off one of the strobes and then you start to learn how one strobe can yield better results than, than two strobes in some yeah. situations. And then I, nev I never, for many years, I never did it because I was comfortable with whatever I was doing. Yeah. And I was thinking the day I'm going to turn off one strobe, at the beginning, the results will be a bit crappy because I'd be experimenting. But that's the time where manta ray will pop out of the, out of the Mediterranean and see where I'm diving or something crazy is going to happen. Yeah. And which, which is total nonsense. But uh, <laughs> that has held me back for a few for a few years for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, you've got to experiment. Mm. Yeah. And it's, it's never going to stop. I mm. mean, you're arguably, <clears throat> excuse me, you're right up there, as, you know, on the top of the tree of, of being pretty damn fucking awesome with a camera. But you're not going to be able to. You're not going to uh, go through the rest of your career not learning something new. There's always going to be something to pick up. Mm. Mm. And when you travel, you have to. I guess um, I'm very conscious when I travel to, you know, this particular species that I'm seeing here. It might be the last time in my life that I'm able to travel there and photograph mm. that species. So I might as well, you know turn on the creative button, you know, yep. to the highest level to say, okay, if I, I might never come back here. What sort of photos will I think about doing when I'm back home on the computer and I'm like, gee, I should have done it. Yeah. That's what I did when I went to the Leafy Sea Dragons in, in, um, in South Australia. I love the experience. Yeah. I don't know when and if I will be able to come back, but I was really full on, but, you know, my mind was buzzing because I was thinking, what, how can I take a different photo of that animal? Yeah. Was that, um, was it, I'm trying to think now because I've looked at so many of your photos, but the leafy wasn't the one where you did the uh, slow shutter speed and the, the animals in focus and the background is blurred? Yeah. I thought it was. And did you do the same with the turtle or something like that? 
I think I've said it before. Um, I did. I did that technique with a few uh, with a few animals uh, recently with the WDC dragon as well. Okay. But um, but yeah, that I think that's probably quite far on the scale of creativity. That sort of technique. You reckon? Very abstract. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's quite abstract, but meaning you get on location. Okay. You're like, okay, the mission is photograph WDC dragons, and at the beginning, I've got zero shots, mm. and they're hard to find as well. So I've got zero shots, and I'm like, okay, I see with DC Dragon. Will I go try this creative technique where three times out of four the photo is going to look like crap? Yeah. No, I want I, I want at least to have a nice, typical, classical portrait of a Widdy to put on my wall one day or show my kids, you know. Yeah. So I start doing that. And then, okay, that portrait is good. Yeah, but the, the thing here was not so nice. There was something there. Oh, I'll do another one and another one. And before you know it, you've spent the, the whole trip doing those typical portraits mm. and at some point I was like no 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 I have to I won't maybe I will not have the perfect side leafy sea dragon shot but I have to try something else I have to change my lighting to see how how it goes with all the nice appendages they have on the skin and all that yeah so yeah and and, and that's again something that I think people members of the underwater club can benefit from because when you go in one of the forums, there's a section where you share your photo and you and you ask. There's two sections. There's one where you share your photos to showcase your work, and people can say, "Okay, that was good. Where did you dive? How was it?" And there's a section when you you specifically ask for feedback. You're like, "Bring it on! I'm willing to accept feedback. Yeah. Make it constructive. Make it uh, be nice, you know. But yeah. give me feedback. Don't make me cry into my cornflakes." Yeah. <laughs> 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 but but I think that's the sort of aha moments that you can get when you ask feedback to, to others. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Okay. If you could change anything about the diving industry or scuba diving in general, mm. what would it be? Uh, I think you know me by, uh, pretty well by now, and that's about reverse. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm writing a lot. On, I've been writing a lot about reverse. Uh, in magazines, uh, on Facebook, uh, in photography forums. Because first, because I'm very passionate about rebreathers. Uh, it's a personal interest for me. The second thing I think I need to say as well, out of transparency, is that I'm sponsored by Mares, mm -hmm. especially with the Horizon. Mares has sponsored uh, the diving I do with, uh, with that. Yeah. So um, just full disclosure, I wanted to, to share it as well. In the same time, I stand by everything I write. And I'm so passionate about rebreathers. I'm writing about them on a regular basis because I think that's the next best thing in diving. The same way that that's, we started diving without a BCD. If you remember the old custom movie, the old yeah. thinning and thinning to try to stand on the bottom, right? At some point, we invented BCDs, mm -hmm. and it became safer and more comfortable. And I think Rib Reverse is really the next, next level. They're becoming safer, safer and safer. And I'm really hoping that you know, the diving industry sort of goes on that journey and that uh, you know, in a few years' time, you travel to remote dive center, you go to the Galapagos, to those places, and you say, hey, I'm coming with a river. They'd be like, yeah, no problem. We, we've got the logistics sorted. Yeah. And that dive centers might even say, okay, do you want to go for a one-hour dive or do you want to go for a three-hour dive? Yeah. So I'm hoping we're going to see more, uh, more of that. There's a lot more of it popping up, mm -hmm. a lot more. Like I say, I've, I've got my sideline, my, my travel agency, yeah, and I'm obviously getting back in touch with all the operators after COVID and getting it all back online. And... Um, that's the one thing that I have noticed. There's a huge increase in um, the opportunities for tech divers. Great. Yeah. Whereas 2019, 2020, it was few and far between. Yeah. yeah. The, the, the other thing I would say I hope to see more and more, and that's something I personally advocate, is that there is, because you can get into the Red Sea, Philippines, and find sometimes some liver boards where there's a one week dedicated for rib rivers. Mm -hmm. But they're going to take you tree mix diving and going very deep. Yeah. Personally, I don't want to do that. No. I'm a photographer. I want to stick to zero to 40 meters, but I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to have better interactions with wildlife, mm. more time in those things. Have you, d have you dived in the Solomons yet? Not yet, no. I'm going there um, November, December this year on a familiarization trip. Yeah, right. Yeah. Wow. Um, I have a feeling it's going to be very, very good along with PNG. We should chat, actually. Maybe we can you know, do a little bit of uh, work together and, and create some trips and events. Mm. And 
I'm mentioning the Solomons because I know the boat is set up for re receiving tech divers as well. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, that would be, yeah, hit me up on that. That'd be uh, we'll that'd be good. Okay. Um, number five. What are your thoughts on ways to minimize human impact on the oceans? Hmm. Um, two, two ways, I think, in particular. Um, the first one is really the plastics. Mm. Reduce plastics, reduce in particular the single-use plastics. So, as we know here in, in Australia, here in New South Wales, we've got new laws coming in that limits what sort of single-use plastics are usable. But I think it also comes down to um, us as consumers to really, really, you know, have that light bulb to realize that every single single-use plastic is a threat to the to the environment. I've seen two two things in day-to-day -day life that still where I, I still think we can improve. For example, when I go, you know, do my grocery or take a go for a takeaway in my local suburb, I go uh, get some chips. For example, mm -hmm. the takeaway place they're lovely people. I like going them and all that. But I always have to say, hey, no, no, no plastic bag, please. I'm going to carry this. Yeah. And I carry my own bag. But it's just so much of a habit that before you can even ask, they've already opened the plastic bag and put it there. Yeah. It's a habit. They, 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 they're doing that to, to help, to be nice. But I think we all need somehow to start to, to, to change a bit that, uh, that habit. Mm. So, um, yeah, and they, 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 I've seen uh, times, for example, Clifton Gardens, we're talking about it. Mm -hmm. Great dive site, but also lovely place for a picnic in a park. Yeah. It's green, it's beautiful. And when you go there on a, you know, on a sh shiny summer weekend, there's lots of people, barbecues and all that. Mm. And you can tell that people being there, they all love nature. Yeah. They wouldn't be there if you didn't like nature. They love nature, they're having a good time. And most of them, I think they like the ocean as well, because there's the beach, they will go swimming and all that. So no one there wants a piece of plastic to end up in the ocean. Mm. But if it's a bit windy, so many people have a few plastic bags with them, bit of wind, plastic is gone, goes in the ocean, and, and I've seen people being like, oh, gee, and then, oh well. No, not how oh well I can't get it, never mind. Yeah. yeah, and I think it's not never mind, it's like, gee, I'm really sorry, but okay, cannot get it. Yeah. And um, so I think we just get, need to get rid as much as we can of all these single-use plastics, and plastic bags in particular, they're just, they're very light, they're, they're very, they're such a, yeah. such a problem. So I see that's a journey and we're we on board, but I think we, we need to progress that. Yeah. I, th I think we'd, we've also got to point out, though, um, think, I'm just thinking, sitting here listening to you now and thinking about the various locations around the world that we go diving. Hmm. I've, got to, I've got to say a bit of a high five to Australia because I think we're pretty fucking switched on when it comes to those single-use plastics. They're not as much of an issue as other countries around the world. Um, however, I do 100% agree. Mm. Let's get rid of all the, all of those plastic bags and just go. Mm. Yeah, it's 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 a habit, right? Uh, it's, very, yeah. it's very easy to get a reusable bag that you can fold, put in your pocket, and uh, and I'm sure we'll get there. But yeah, let's let's get there. Yeah, and I think the the other thing I'm very very um, uh, supportive of is establishing marine parks. Um, I'm I'm also mindful about the fact that uh, there's different ways to love the ocean. We are divers. Some of us are fishermen, spare fishers as well. And when you say, hey, let's make this a marine park, we're asking them a big, bigger sacrifice than we're asking to ourselves. Because yeah. we can still enjoy it. They can't anymore. Yeah. But I really think that from what I've seen in places like the Mediterranean Sea, where we've overfished, polluted all that we could, not knowing what we were doing, mm. uh, the example I gave before, this little place, uh, not too far from Cannes, which is a pretty big city. You've got the festival going on. It's pretty, pretty dense in terms of population mm. but the local fishermen the local uh, cooperative of fishermen mm -hmm. they went together they said okay yeah the fish stocks are falling not good for business let's let's agree that this rock here and you know like i don't know 500 meters that no one touches it yeah they had the thumbs up from the local authorities but not much support not much funding but they they, they did it went for 10 years and they said what we want to get really is to fish more around it but we want to give the opportunity for the fish to spawn, to grow, to spawn, and for more larvae to populate around. Mm. After 10 years, they love the result and they keep on doing it. Mm. So there is one, there's one thing going on uh, actually since a few years now, which is I think the, 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 the language is uh, uh, 30 by 30. It's a, it's a, it's a, politi it's a let's say, political idea possibly, but, but the idea is essentially that by 2030, 
we should really try to protect 30% of the ocean surface. Mm. And if we do that, we created, we protect one third of the ocean. In all of these one thirds, fish are able to grow to a point where they can be mature, they can spawn. Yeah. And with ocean currents, they're going to replenish surrounding places where people can fish. Uh, you know, commercial fisheries can keep on uh, on being successful. And I really think that is something that we've got to do. And it's, yeah, there will be sacrifices here and there to do for, for some of us. And, um, but I, re I really think we have to go there and that, that's how we can give the ocean a second chance. Yeah, yeah. And it's got to be done. Um, there's no two ways around it. Mm. You know, the, 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 the figures are there, the, the information's there. Um, the only thing that's preventing it is effectively greed. Mm. Um, you know. But that's, I'm, I'm, I'm very, I'm very, very, very mindful of the fact that, again, it's easier for us divers to say, let's protect, uh, let's make sure no one fishes for in, the, in this stretch of one kilometer of beach. Mm. For us, it's going to be heaven. We're going to have more fish to see and all that. Mm. People who maybe cannot dive or don't want to dive for whatever reason, health, whatever reason the case might be, but they, they, lo they love of the ocean, the habit is fishing. We're asking them to a harder decision, a harder sacrifice than we do. So yeah. I hope we find ways to, to, to go on that journey together. Yeah, it's, it's, the, it's the big fishing corporations that need to be targeted. Mm. You know, if they, if they rein, rein it in and not be chasing the dollar, then um, those people that rely on the oceans and the seas, Papua New Guinea, people who live on the coasts in Papua New Guinea, mm. uh, Africa, you know, South America, um, all these places, Indonesia, they all feed from the sea. Mm. You know, and they're, they're getting starved out because you know, corporate companies are, are just raping the seas of all of the food. Mm. Yeah, it's yeah no, tricky situation. I do think as well in some places where the population is very, is very, very dense, like, like the, the southeast of France where I've been, I think that aside from the, the big fisheries that go, that go out of sea, the density of how many people fish in a location can can go beyond what the local environment is able to sustain. Yeah. So the example I give there is uh, the shore diving I used to do when I was living there. So I was living in Antibes, which is very close to the famous Cannes. Mm -hmm. There's a few shore dives there. It's from starter. It's a very very densely populated area. There's no single piece of uh, of coast in the few towns there that is not built. Yeah. Right. And in summer it becomes even more densely populated because lots of people from the rest of the country, they come to enjoy and sun bath and all that. Mm -hmm. And people that go there, they say, okay, I'm going to spend one week by the sea enjoying hot weather and all that. They're, they're like, okay, how, how am I going to, to enjoy my vacation? And lots of them will go fishing yeah. or spear fishing. And they're not regular spear fishers. They're not regular spear fisher. They will just do that a few days just to, to try it out. For you a know, bit of fun. For a bit of fun. Mm. But being in the water and knowing how few fishes you can find there, how small they are, mm. you really see that, especially in summer, we get in those places above what the local wildlife can sustain. Yeah. Diving there, you see some fish species that are not reaching the size when they can spawn. They're not. The only reason why you have fish is because there's a marine park about 100 kilometers away where it's no take zone. The fish spawn and the ligure current that runs the coast there brings the uh, brings the larvae and replenishes. But locally, yeah, there's not Nothing. there's not the ability for the fish to reproduce. Yeah. It's a podcast in itself, that one, isn't it? E. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. Um, has your passion for diving changed over time? And if so, how? Hmm. Um. I think the main thing essentially is was with what we spoke about before is I've been for the first few years all focused about taking photos myself uh, and supporting Lena taking her photos underwater. That was really the main thing. And it is still today somehow I wouldn't see myself going diving if you were telling me, hey, come with me in the Galapagos for that wonderful trip you're going to do. Mm -hmm. But you cannot bring a camera. I won't go. No, I, I just can't. <laughs> I'm, I'm there to take photos. Yeah. But so the change for me in the recent years has been that um, I want to do, uh, to focus a lot of my time around teaching and sharing what I know and in the form of the underwater club community where I'll be part of a bigger group. I'll be exchanging with all those photographers and helping them grow. Yeah. That's an awesome, awesome route to go. Um, 
Is there a particular conservation effort that you're passionate about? And if so, which one and why? Hmm. There's a few, uh, but I think I'll focus on, on one. And this is one I've discovered really very, very, very recently. Um, it's not actually exactly a conservation effort, but I think it still fits the bill. So recently I've been hired an assignment to film a, um, an experiment in the water. The experiment is connected by a team called Whale X. Mm -hmm. And Whale X, what they do is, I've all learned the, th the whole thing about what they do in the, in the last few weeks, and I've been fascinated. So you know that we've taken, our countries have taken commitments towards uh, reducing, uh, you know, CO2 in the atmosphere. Yeah. As a result, we're looking for ways to capture CO2. And what Whale X are offering as a solution is they're saying, well, the oceans, as we know, have a capacity to absorb a lot of CO2 in the form of phytoplankton, which basically grab the CO2 from the atmosphere, and as they die and they drown in the ocean, they bury the CO2 for possibly hundreds or thousands of years deep into the ocean. Okay. So this is a fantastic way of doing it. Mm. The problem is we don't have as much phytoplankton as we used to have before. And what Whalex proposes to do is to bring in nutrients in the ocean in places where the bottleneck for uh, wildlife to, to grow mm -hmm. is the lack of nutrients. So they're bringing the nutrients there. They allow phytoplankton to grow. And the beauty is that phytoplankton can grow very, very quickly. In mm -hmm. five days, you can have a few, less, a few life cycles going on. As phytoplankton grows, it captures CO2. But the second, uh, the second positive effect is that as it grows, it provides food from the next step in the food chain, which is zooplankton. Mm. As zooplankton grows, it provides food for fish mm. and fish stock can grow. So long story short, they are at, at the moment they are experimenting and I was there filming the, one of their experiments, but they've got a fantastic idea. At scale, they have the capability to capture, I think up to 10% of the world's CO2 production. Wow. It is massive. And at the same time, helping replenish some of the fish stocks. That's, that's awesome. It is fantastic. You have to um, give me some of those links. I'll have a look at that. I will. Yeah. And I know they'd be looking for investors as well. So, you know, if there's someone listening to the podcast who, mm. who sees, because there's also a, a very a very good business potential. Because yeah. companies, corporations, basically the ones that produce most CO2, they're looking for ways to offset the CO2. And that's a, yeah. I think that's a very effective way because, well, you do capture the CO2, but the solution, which is to bury it down in the ocean, is capturing and, and bring it down for thousands of years. Yeah. So you basically you score high in terms of your commitments of reducing CO2. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Okay. Um, of the many safety procedures we have in the industry, if you had to choose one as the most important, well, what would it be? Hmm. I think um, uh, I'm just reflecting on, the, on my, 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 my early years of, uh, of diving, hmm. and I, I think the, the, the body check mm -hmm. that we do before diving has helped me avoid quite a few serious issues. Uh, running through that check, checking all the all the that your gear is proper, uh, is ready, is going to function, and having someone else check over you as you do it, I think mm. is very important. Yeah, yeah. It's surprising how many people forget it. Mm. You know, or they do a modified version because they can't actually remember how to do it properly. Yeah. yeah. But the thing is, if you dive long enough, as you would have, as, as experienced divers would have, then one of one day you end up facing the consequences of that. Yeah. And I remember one day we were diving with Lena and a few friends, south of France, and we skipped the, the body check. Or we, yeah, I think we skipped it because it was a bit of a rush. We were with a group of people. Mm. Anyways, I jumped in the water and I didn't realize that my BCD's hose inflator was not connected to the tank. Uh -huh. So I'm like, oh, great, great visibility. I was like hovering in 20, 30 meters of water. The bottom was another 20 meters below. I could really see it with the beautiful Vs. Mm. And I realized I was falling. I was like, inflate, inflate. Oh, gee, I'm not inflating. And, um, and I started to panic. Mm. And then, oh, fortunately, there was a dive master not far. He saw me. He showed me, take your inflator, inhale, exhale an inflator. You can inhale, uh, fill, you know, refill it uh, with your mouth. Yeah. But in the panic, I didn't realize, and I was getting pretty stressed. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Um, I had a panic. Uh, a proper uh, fear panic mm. back in December. I've got um, Dr. Professor, I can't remember his title now, sorry, Simon Mitchell coming on the show mm. next month. 
and we're going to discuss through stuff like that because I think um, you know no matter how much experience you've got you know you can control panic when it kicks in but it really does shake your boots hmm. yeah yeah I'm, I don't know how I would real I would react you know if I find myself without without gas at depth mm. that has happened to me in the early years again I would probably be a bit more serene but yeah I can I can I can certainly imagine the the pulse going to the mm. roof very quickly mm. I think I mean would it be fair to say I mean that I do get the feeling that as as divers we progress and we focus on all the different elements as we progress through diving and get more experience however and I'll, I'll put my hand up to it you know there are times where um, in the past I would practice regularly practice different scenarios just to make sure I'm safe mm. but nowadays those practices are less and less mm. I think we come a l become a little bit overconfident in what we've done in the past and and don't keep up to speed with those practices mm. yeah it's interesting yeah mm. but yeah for 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 a long time you haven't had any problems it's yeah i guess it's a bit hard to have that to keep that discipline but we should yeah yeah, yeah. there's only when you get a bit of a kick in the bum it reminds you yeah. <laughs> okay moving on let's uh let's line it up a little bit and um tell me This is one of the most difficult questions you're ever going to get asked in your life. Tell me your top five bucket list destinations. Man, that's a hard one. I know. Um, Everybody says that. Yeah. <laughs> But I think, yeah, um, I was thinking about it in the train before. I guess uh, Galapagos for sure. Mm -hmm. um, I'm hearing a lot of good things about Socorro in Mexico. Yep. So I'd begin to go there as well. Um, Raja Ampat, never been there. But everyone's saying it's fantastic, and I can see some pretty good photos coming up from there. So, yeah, thumbs up for Raja and Pat. Um, Antarctica, yeah, different landscapes. I, I love the ice. I love the light, uh, what it does on the water. So I'd definitely be keen for that. Yeah. And was there a fifth one? Uh, That's G. Mediterranean. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, th there are things I love about the Med, but I wouldn't dream of going back uh, necessarily. <sighs> Yeah, I think uh, there's more, but I just can't remember. Mm. You're one short. I'm one short. How's that possible? Um, I think, um, yeah, let's say possibly the Solomons. Because mm. that, that, that sounds really good with a good mix of wrecks and yeah. very, very vibrant corals. So uh, yeah. I can be wrong. I'll take lots of photos and you can have a look. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I remember um, uh, Track Lagoon in uh, uh, yes. Micronesia. Yeah. That would be lots and lots of fun to go there, you know, remote lighting, buddies, do lots of creating stuff going yeah. on. I've got um, Pete Mesley coming on the show yeah, next right. month, uh, Lust for Rust. Yep. So um, he does an awful lot of work out of Chuck. So it might be one worth uh, noting for when it, that's uh, that's when that's it airs. That's the one that we're listening for yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, okay, last question for you. Um, how would you describe the dive community to a non-diver? Hmm. I think um, if two divers meet, two divers that two divers that don't know each other, they, I feel there's there's always they're always going to be able to have a chat mm. and you know get passionate about something. So I think there's there's something that pulls us together. And although in saying that. I've realized that in diving, there's lots of different sub tracks, sub routes. Mm -hmm. Some people go for biology. They could spend hours on a seagrass bed looking for seagrass. Yep. Some people will go crazy deep just because they want to go deep. Some people will just enjoy the perfecting their skills and teaching how you how to rescue someone at the right pace from 40 to zero meters. I do photography, but within photography, there are cave divers, there are wreck photographers, macro, super macro, and all that. Mm. So I think we are a very, very diverse bunch at the same time. Yeah. The divers are a diverse bunch. <laughs> but there's always something that connects us. And, uh, and in that sense, I think it's a very welcoming and uh, friendly community. Oh, I do too. I think it's a beautiful community. Mm. Yeah, fantastic. Um, right, I think, I think we should go and get some pizza and a, a beer. Yeah, and we've good. been going on for a couple of hours now. Yep. Yeah. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to chuck out there before we depart? Um, 
No, I think we've wrapped it up nicely. And uh, just a big thank you for having me. I've been, uh, you know, looking forward to, to do that for a while. And uh, yeah, well, yeah, it felt good. Now you'll be able to listen to yourself on the show as well. That would be good fun. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Mate, it's been a pleasure. And uh, yeah, let's go and get a beer. Same here. Let's go. Everybody who's listening, thanks for now. And uh, see you later. Bye bye. This is Scuba Go Go Under the Sea, the podcast for the inquisitive diver.